Hey, welcome to Short Circuit of Brewers. In this live session, we're going to be talking to Tony Yates about water composition, do a test, and answer some questions. And that's coming up next. Hey, welcome again to the live stream. Uh, just kind of let you know what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a water test and we're going to be answering some questions. Once this live stream is over and uh, the replay, if you're watching the replay, I'm going to go back and put time codes in the description down below and let you know at what point the questions are answered, you know, when we're done with the water test. So if you want to jump around in the video and see a question that you want answered or, you, you know, a question that you have, um, you know, you'll be able to do that by looking down in the description below. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Tony Yates, and he is his uh, YouTube channel, for those of you that may not know, is uh, Northern, uh, it's Northern Rock. Brewery? It's actually just Tonester three two okay. one. Okay. It's old school. That what's your way. what's your uh, what's your YouTube channel name for your when your logo comes up? Tony Yates. Okay. Uh, the logo for the the Bruin channel yeah. is Northern Rock Brewery. Okay. okay. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> YouTube.com slash Tonester three two one. Tonester three two one. Awesome. All right. Very good. Well, Tony, why don't you give them a little bit of background? How long you've been uh, brewing, and uh, you know what uh, what got you into brewing, and and uh, when you started really caring about water? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I haven't been brewing as long as a lot of people. I've only been brewing since 2012, so that brings it just over uh, five, six years. And um, you know, back then, like so many others, you know, I got started watching YouTube videos. Uh, started off with a canned kit that I got locally in a, uh, a grocery store and uh, started from there. After a little while, you add a little bit of enhancers, do a little bit of dry hopping. Um, and then you see, you know, extravagant systems that are out there that, you know, I wanted. And so, uh, you know, you discover sites like the electricbrewery.com and you just, you, that's, that's what you want to do. You know you want to do all grain eventually. And so you see a site like that that provides detailed instructions on how to do it. And so I spent basically seven months building the system, putting it all together, all the while still brewing kits and, uh, you know, with one main focus in mind. And now I've been brewing on that system since 2012. And uh, I haven't looked back since. I started looking into water probably about a year and a half to two years ago. And like so many others, uh, you follow all of the YouTube videos that you can find with John Palmer um, on the, the Beer Smith podcast, also up on uh, was it Northern Brewers uh, pages, uh, all the reviews. And of course, when him and Colin Kaminsky went out and wrote the water book, that was phenomenal as well. Um, Interestingly enough, you have a lot of the same information in a lot of the brewing sheets, uh, free up, up online, available for download, both brewing water and then as well as up on brewersfriend.com. They've got, you know, a lot of the, the basic knowledge that you learn uh, in the water book. Um, so I read those after the fact, uh, after I read the water book. Um, and, you know, pretty much it says the same thing, but... I think we're like creatures of habit. The more and more we do something, the better we get at it. And the, the more that it sort of sinks in and it, all the lights you know, sort of start to flicker on and then uh, you get how, how things work and how things are constructed. But yeah, that's me. That's my brewing uh, history. And that's how I got interested in water. I like how things work. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. Um, so, you know, I've been dabbling with a little bit of water adjustments myself. I, I do make some water adjustments here and there. But, you know, in preparation for this live session, you and I had some discussions. And one of those things that, you know, I didn't realize was that the water changes so much over a period of time. You know, in the wintertime, it might be a little different than the summertime. In the spring and the fall, you have more runoff or whatever. And, you know, with that being the case, it, uh, it it's really important that you get your water tested frequently uh either through you know a kit like we're going to demo here or you know by sending it off and you know having some some lab analyze it um you know the lab analysis is pretty expensive in my you know experience it's usually like 35 40 uh in the u.s here i don't know what it is you know where you are over in, in uh in uh 
Sweden, but um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like uh, it gets costly, and, and a kit like this is is fairly uh, you know cost effective when you look at you can do multiple tests. But you know, uh, ex- kind of give, give me a little bit of explanation as to you know uh, how often somebody might want to want to test their water, and and you know, and, and would you track it and kind of use that as a standard? Um, what would you do with that? No, it's a good question. Um, I'll just back up a little bit where when I actually ordered the the, the brew lab online uh, from the American website, had it shipped here um, as I started to read the water book. So in anticipation of uh, understanding the water, then I wanted the ability to test it. And then, of course, uh, once I did test it and that helped me get to understand the concepts and the, the all the moving parts as I was reading the book, I was able to play around and see how these things work. But fundamentally, the Brew Lab is a titration kit. So it allows you to use the different chemicals that it ships with in order to do uh, titration. So basically taking uh, values or pHs uh, or yeah, values or concentrations of uh, these ions in the water and then uh, using acid or uh, different types of uh, liquids to uh, bring them to a another uh, value that will then change the color and give you an indication of what's going on. So it makes it really, really easy to figure out how this stuff works. Um, when I started using it uh, and I got my very first uh, water report using it, it was dead simple, very easy, uh, hard to get wrong, actually. Um, there was only one question I remember at the time that I had and it was about uh, a little bit of things I'll point it out as we go through the test today. Okay. Um, when it comes to alkalinity, I didn't know. Yeah, alkalinity is one of those things that are a little bit disturbing because you don't know if it's, is this residual alkalinity or total alkalinity? Uh, there are a few different types of alkalinity words that are thrown around. And so I, I kind of questioned that during uh, my actually water video. And John Palmer actually <laughs> responded oh, really? on the video. And <laughs> I, I didn't said, see okay, that. that's, that's total alkalinity. <laughs> I'll point that out later, but uh, yeah. Um, I remember watching your, so, your test of it and seeing you go, okay, I don't know if it's total alkalinity or residual alkalinity. Because I, I watched through your whole video of using the, the kit. And, and it was, I remember yeah. you having that kind of a question there. So that was one of the things I was going to ask. So we'll cover that as we go along. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so I let uh, time go. And uh, I remember as winter came on, I went ahead and tested the water again. And the values had changed. Not dramatically, but they had changed enough. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. And as the, the weeks passed, I got more and more people asking me about the, the water uh, tests and the results for my area and people that lived in my area. And then I had offered in the videos to, if people wanted to send me their water, I would be you know, more than happy to test it for them. And so I did, I ended up testing around 12 different uh, water sources around here in Norway and a couple out of Sweden. And the results were uh, fairly close, but some of them, there was a couple of outliers that were significantly different based on the water sources. There was a couple different well sources okay. rather than just normal city water. But cool. um, all pretty much uh, soft water over here, so it was kind of interesting. But it changes anywhere between uh, 10 to uh, 30 parts per million here. It's, it's really not a huge amount, but right. it's interesting to see those changes as they occur, differences between summer and winter. And then you can also, I think you can see changes quarterly okay uh, depending on rainfall and you know dryness things like that and a quick correction by the way um and and that's what interests me too was um in ohio here we use salt on the roads now do they use uh salt in norway not sweden by the way i want to correct myself somebody corrected me on the chat there um do they use salt over there to treat the roads and and does that you know go into the water supply and change the composition not around where I live. Um, salt's not a big uh, way to get rid of the snow. Uh, most of the plows over here 
which was kind of interesting, uh, just sort of a bit of a side note, <laughs> is uh, a lot of the local farmers, huge tractors with plows. And so that's what you see out on the road most okay. of the time. There are, are a few uh, local community uh, big trucks, you know, with plows, but those are far and few in between. Most of the people live in little rural communities and most of the local farmers are out plowing the, the streets. And they don't use salt on the on the back of okay. their things. I got you. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know we're we're uh, we're sissies over here. We're not used to as much snow as you guys get. Because I've seen some pictures of your uh, hikes and everything. I'm like, mm, that's a lot of snow. So, <laughs> um, well, let's get into doing the test on this. And I uh, just want to say hey to a couple people: uh, Neuter Homebrew, Tom, AJ, uh, Jim from Craft Malt Direct, uh, Stefan Brig, uh, Jamie Strada. We see all you guys. Uh, we're I'm watching the chat periodically here. I'm going to be doing a, a test on the water. Uh, hey, Peter. And, um, you know, Tony's going to kind of walk me through it a little bit and I'll show the test, uh, on the camera over here. I'll show you the vials and everything as we do it. So we can see the, the water change. Hey, Larry. And, uh, we'll just go through it and, uh, I'll need to make some notes, uh, and probably do a little bit of math at some point here. So, um, I guess we'll just, we'll wing it and we'll get, we'll get it done. <laughs> All right, so the first thing that we want to do, or if you take a, the, the kit uh, as an overall, um, first, you did ask me about this, and I, and I, I will come back to it. The price for the, this kit, specifically this kit, is well worth it. If you, uh, you, you can get more, but they say minimum, you can get at least 50 tests out of it. And I tell you what, uh, the kit pays for itself as soon as you start doing tests for other people because you do a test for other people, they'll give you a beer or two at least. Yeah. And hey, you know, yeah, exactly. It pay for itself. Over here in Norway, uh, to do a, a local test, uh, to get my water tested locally, uh, one time was uh, around $150. No way was I going to do that. So this wow. kit paid for that. And I've used it several, several times since then. So. Wow. Uh, right. Okay. For the kit itself. So what we want to do is we want to basically get out um, about four different things, really. We want hardness. We want alkalinity. And then we also want chlor uh, chloride and sulfite. And then from those values, we'll do a little bit of math at the end in order to get the sodium. Um, so hardness, alkalinity, uh, sulfate, and chloride. And then we'll do some math to get the sodium. Okay. And then I got a nice little uh, sheet out there for you to use in order to automatically uh, calculate those values for you. I'll we'll okay. share that with you. And then just a side note too, if, that, if you don't mind, um, I will leave a link to both the kit uh, that we're using down in the description. I think it may already be there, but if it's not, I'll add it. And then I'll add a link to Tony's calculator so you guys can use that as well. Um, so for our, what's our first test, Tony? It's going to be total hardness. Uh, so let's go ahead and I'll bring that up on my screen so that uh, everyone can see it. Okay. Here we go. And with this one, it, we have one little tube that we want to use that we're going to share uh, for all of the hardness tests. We're going to do uh, two total hardness tests, which is one for total hardness and one, one for calcium hardness. And then we'll also uh, do... Uh, a magnesium hardness test at the end, so three total hardness tests. Okay, now one I know for in your, your total, video, one for go. calcium, one, and one for magnesium. In your video, Sorry? you use the upper uh, line in the the hardness tube. Is that right? Yeah, it's a great question. Let me go ahead. I'll uh, bring that up a little bit. Uh, I'll zoom in on it because you can do an upper line limit or you can do a lower line limit and basically it just means how much water you're going to use and the more water you use the more drops that you're going to need to use but i believe the more accurate it's going to be so i use the upper line limit and then i can based on the number of drops that will each drop will count for 10 parts per million so it makes it very very easy to calculate okay so i've got uh I've got it up to the 10 parts per million. And then uh, what are we going to use as far as additive well, goes upper, on it? What's the upper line limit? Uh, ten. This is the hardness tube, right? We're looking at? Or is this one of the... Because it's the tube number 4488. 
Yep, I just didn't see it. Uh, I should show get you the on the screen here. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah, what's the higher one? Is there a higher level around um, it? It just says uh, hardness tube, and that's just the codes on there. So the bottom one is 20 parts per million, then there's a 1 GPG, and then the upper one is 10 parts per million is the upper one. Yep, okay. So, yep, we want the upper one. Okay. So then uh, we're going to put one drop of the uh, 40. For that, we want to start off and add five drops of the hardness reagent, which is 4483. Okay, let's see here. Let me find this thing. It's the biggest one, I believe. The biggest one? Hardness number seven? That's 4487. There you go. 4487 is what we're going to add? That's number 4483. Oh, here it is right here. Okay. Sorry, it was hiding on me. <laughs> Sorry about that. So you said five drops of that? <laughs> yep, five drops. All right, so we'll put in five drops. And it's either going to turn red or blue. It's going to turn red if there's hardness present. Okay, so do I swirl it around then? Yep. After you add five and five drops, swirl it around. And when you add those drops, you want to make sure that the container that contains the liquid the, that you're taking the drops from is, you know, uh, straight up and down. So it's not tilted sideways or oh, okay. diagonally. Okay. I had it kind of tilted it should a little be bit vertical. diagonally, but um, it didn't change color at all. Yeah. No, okay. It's not going to change color until we add in a hardness oh, reagent okay. tablet. Okay. All right. So that, that yeah, sorry. That's a bit, I got a little <laughs> bit ahead of ourselves. But uh, so we add in the hardness reagent in order to get it to a standard that we know. So okay. then we're going to have a concentration of uh, chemicals in there that we know of. And then the hardness reagent will react with that okay. and tell us if there's hardness or not. Okay. So we're going to so put in one of those tablets. If there is hardness, Yep, just one of them. Okay. Let me get that down here. There's two types of tablets or, uh, for hardness. There's these for calcium, total hardness, and then there's one also afterwards for the uh, Yeah, this the is the 4484. The 4484, yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to get the camera to focus here, and we'll swirl it up there. Yeah. It's getting started. So it's just starting to turn red, so that's good. It means there is some hardness there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're about completely dissolved uh, from what I can see here. Yep, so it turned like a it's pretty okay nice if you just... uh, purple shade there. Yeah. All right. If you give it just another, like, 30 seconds or so, should be fine. Okay. It'll all so dissolve that's good. There. Yep. Okay. All right. Very good. If it if it if it turned blue, then that would mean that you had no hardness at all. So okay, that'd be good that. for samples. Let me move this back a little bit here. So there we can see the color of it. And okay, so now what uh, what's our next step here? Now we not we want the. Uh, the hardness reagent, the 4487, that's the, the large one. The largest bottle, okay, I got you. So we're going to add one drop at a time and uh, swirl. And each drop represents 10 parts per million, so we want to keep track of how many number of drops that we put in okay. for it to change from red to blue. All right. Well, let's go ahead and show that on the camera. One. Oh, yeah. All right, so I, draw, I put in one already. Okay, and then you want to put I'll in a drop around. and then swirl it around. And then just give it a good swirl. And basically, it says in, in the, the book, you know, give it a good swirl. And if it changes color, make sure that it changed, it stays changed for at least 20 seconds. Okay. Or 30 seconds. All right. So now we'll So put two... Yep, so this will be number three. And we'll... Straight up and down? Yep. Ooh. Swirl it around. Not seeing any color change just yet. 
on it. No. So, do number four. It's it will be obvious because it'll go like a little bit purple first, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah, I remember seeing when you were uh, doing the uh, test over at uh, Thomas Hop Rod, the Hop Rod Garage that uh, I saw it turn really uh, interestingly blue. So this will be number five. Now, do you have any idea how hard your water is? You know, I'd have to look at the Ward's lab, the Ward lab uh, report that I had, but I, I'm thinking it was a hundred, uh, pretty close to a hundred, something like that. Okay, so we're about halfway then. Yeah. So that was five. So this would be number six. Possibly. Oh. Yeah. A little shaky hand there. A little on the side. The numbers. Yeah, I just got one. It's starting to change color a little bit. That's about. That's six. Yeah, that was about seven, I think. Why well, one of the drops landed on the, go side. On the side? Now. Yeah, one of them landed on the side. <laughs> yeah. All right. So this would be number seven. Alright, let's okay. see here. Can see it start to change. Yeah, it's starting to turn a little bit. Mm -hmm. Alright, and we'll go eight. Yeah, now I see it starting to turn blue. It's starting to I just when I dropped it in there I started to see it turn blue. Yeah, and I love that the packaging for the Lamont Brew Kit is blue because it gives you something to yeah. <laughs> contrast Compare against. it against, yeah, exactly. All right, so this will be nine. Uh, yeah, my water's, it, it has been pretty hard. In the, I think, I'm thinking it was like 100, 115 or something like that, I think it was. So yeah, it's, hmm. uh, it's still purple. Hasn't turned that royal blue yet, so. Yeah. Got to keep going. Yep. This will be 10. Yeah, I see it's starting to sort a little blue now. There it's going. It's still not quite blue, though. It's still pretty purple. A little bit of purple, yeah. Yep, just a little bit. All right, and this will be 11. Okay. There we go. Nice. That's supposed to hold for 30 seconds, that's, right? That's what you want to see, right? Right. Yep. That's definitely the blue that you want. Okay, so we had 11. Boom. I'm gonna... so, all right, 11 it is. I'm going to do a little notepad here so I can... Keep track of this so then 11 then we're going to multiply that number um what are we multiplying by 10, that by? By 10? we're going to multiply that by 10 yeah okay. if we use the upper line then we'll multiply that by 10. so that'll be 110. now if we were to use the lower line then we multiply it by 20. okay so i think using the upper line you have to use a little bit more chemical but mm -hmm. at the same time you get more precision yeah that's what i was thinking too with the upper line you're you're getting more of a, a better sample so um yep let's so see. using that then you say okay multiply that by 10 and then that will give you total parts per million as calcium carbonate okay so the ca caco3 that's right all right. Okay. So, what, moving on, what uh, what's the next uh, one we're going to do? Now we want to differentiate between total hardness, and we want to pick out just the calcium hardness. Okay. So, what we're going to do is clean out that same tube okay. and refill it back up to the top line. All right. Hang on just a second. Thanks for watching, everybody. We certainly appreciate it, and uh, hopefully this is educational for everyone. We're going to get to some questions 
here in a little bit. Just wanted to run through this real quick and get a get a number. So, all right. You still there, Tony? Oh. All right. Yep. Yeah, I'm. Uh, okay. I'm right here. Okay. So, go ahead. Samples filled back up. Yep. All right. So now this time we're going to add in six drops of the sodium hydroxide reagent, which is four two five nine. Okay. So that'd be the four two five nine, which is that one there. So you said five yep. drops of that, or six drops? Six drops. Okay. All right. Let me uh, get that. One, two, three, four, five, and six. All right. Now we need the uh, calcium hardness indicator tablet. We do. That would be the uh, 5250. Okay, got that. Not the same as the other one. Right. Now, if I remember right, this one is the only one that comes with a little yes. cotton ball or something <laughs> yeah. on top. Yeah, exactly. That's what okay. I that's what I experienced there. So, all right, let's swirl this and uh, see what we come up with here. Looking nice and red. Yeah. Good. All right. Okay, yeah. so that looks pretty dissolved from what I can see there. Looking pretty good. Yeah, yeah I really like that light that you got there. Yeah, it shows um, the color pretty well. So now we're going to, yeah, we're going to use the same hardness reagent we had uh, before from the big, the biggest bottle, okay, the number four seven. four eight seven. Okay. Yep. Same uh -huh. procedure as last time. Each drop accounts for ten parts per million. Okay. All right. So we do one drop and swirl. Yep. One drop and swirl. All right. We got some reaction. Looks like already. I don't think it's going to take. I would be very surprised if you had. Uh, well, I don't know. I guess depending, but um, out of 110 parts per million of total hardness, if you came out with just 20 parts per million of calcium, that would be very surprising. To yeah, me. that would be a little weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Since calcium yeah. uh, equates to some hardness. All right. Uh, this will be number three. All right. It's starting to turn. Still a little, little purple though. Yeah. All right. This will be number four. Yeah. Still the ways to go. It looks like uh, probably going to take one more from just what I'm seeing here. That's good purple. All right. That's number five. And, yep, I think that, uh, boy, it looks like it's still a little purple, though, from what I can see. Yeah, give it 30 seconds. Yep. Let's see if it changes any colors at all. Mm -hmm. It's nice. It's still, yeah, still more purple than blue. Yep, it kind of it kind of yeah. rolled back to purple a little bit, so be six. There we are. Well, you can see the change like almost immediately when it changes. Yeah. Crazy blue. Awesome. Yeah. Let's just uh, give it. Let's mm -hmm. give it a little bit more time. Okay. I'll sort a little bit more. And but uh, yeah, it's it's nice that you can see that definition. Yeah. Looks like it almost wants to roll back a little purple, doesn't it? At least it does on my end, anyways. 
Yeah, it didn't stay quite that brilliant blue color. It kind of rolled. It's rolled back to purple now. If you can kind of see. I can see. Um, I I have a monitor up, so I can see you coming off um, on the screen, and I do see it's more blue than it was purple. Yeah. But um, it's not quite as blue as the other one was. No. Actually, yeah, it's it's. If you want to add in one, yeah, I'll do one more. So what is that? Seven. This will be seven. Yeah. 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 There it went blue. Yeah, that's definitely blue again. We'll let it sit for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's more brilliant blue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll accept that. So let's call that one seven then. Okay. And so then that would basically mean out of 110 parts per million, then you have 70 parts per million as calcium carbonate that is calcium. Okay. So in order to, uh, yeah. do you want to switch that over to the, uh, no. Yeah, let me do. I'm sorry. I'm I'm looking at your screen on my. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> this is a I need a first producer. time we tried this out. Yeah, so. I need a producer, man. <laughs> so, uh, in order to uh, determine that, then we say, okay, for, we're using the upper line, so we need to multiply the seven times ten. That gives us seventy. Right. So that record our calcium hardness as seventy parts per million as calcium carbonate. Okay. But that's not the value that you're going to use in any of the water calculators. In the water calculators, they expect you to give you just the calcium as a parts per million or milligrams per liter. And then that is the value for CA plus two. Okay. Um, in order to get that, you take the 70 and multiply that by 0.4, and that will give you the value to use in the calculators. Okay. So 70 times 0. So, 0.4, so that'd be what, uh, yeah. uh, what is that? Get that right here, so that would be by 0. 0.4, that gives you 28. 28, and what is that value? That's the calcium? As magnesium, that's the calcium, yes. Okay. So that's calcium milligrams per liter, okay. or just parts per million. Okay, all right. All right, very and good. then below that, we'll see you can deduce what the magnesium is. So you take your total hardness value, which was 110 parts per million minus the 70, and then that gives you the total calcium as parts per million as calcium carbonate, which is 40. Okay. And and that so that's 40 parts per million as calcium carbonate, but that, again, that's not the value you want to use on most of the water calculators. For that, you want to use the magnesium milligrams per liter. Okay. So in order to get that, you take the 40 and multiply it by 0.24, and that will give you 9.6. Okay, so 9.6, and that's the magnesium? Part. That's the magnesium, yeah. Okay. Making notes here as I go along. All right. Um, okay. So sure. now uh, you can just go ahead and set that aside because we're not going to be using it anymore. Okay. All right. Very good. And now it comes to the chloride. Okay. Oop. For the chloride, we want to use the, the bigger 715 tube. It's got a cap on top. We can just take that cap off. Okay. We want to fill it up to the 25 milliliter mark okay. so that. Again, we can have a better resolution. Okay. The best resolution. I and mean, then we're going to get that up to 25 milliliters. All right. So I think we're there. Okay. 
All right. And then we want to add in five drops of the chloride reagent, 4069. Okay. Five uh, drops. Chloride reagent. And that's the 5069, you said? 4069. 4069. Okay, there it is, 4069E. All right. And so how many drops of it? Five drops? Five. Okay. All right. Yep. Let me shake this up a little bit. Straight up and down. One, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Looks like a light. It will turn. Yeah, it will stay yellow or like a, a very light orangey color. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to put the silver nitrate in there. Right. So the silver nitrate, the uh, 3824. Mm -hmm. Got it. And again, same procedure as last time. Each drop is going to account for 10 parts per million. Okay. And so one drop and swirl. It's, it's going to change color. Yeah, it's going to change color from yellow to a, a brown, orange brown, right. orangish brown color. Ooh. See a little bit of action there already. Yeah. Almost like, I remember somebody's video they used to have where it was a yeast pitch. I believe it was uh, Alan down in uh, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, Shadow Beast Brewery. Uh, in the beginning of his video, he started off by dropping, a, it was a yeast pitch. I don't know if it was in cider or beer, but you had that same effect. Yeah. <laughs> it was always really nice and cool. Yeah. So we got... Uh, that was one? Two? It's awful bright, actually. It's okay. hard to see. There we go. Kind of hold it back so you can see it a little better. There it is. Yeah, there we go. So we'll get a little swirl yeah. here. Still pretty yellow. Yeah. All right. So it'll be it'll be more orange brown than that yeah. for sure. Three. Oh wow, that was a big, wild looking drop there mm. it's starting to get there it's still going starting. back to yellow though yep it's getting there so that's three go another one all right one more that'll be four. Oh wow yeah that definitely uh had some effect on it for sure Looking like a shandy now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to take more than that. Yep. Mm. I see a five in our future. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's definitely didn't change enough. All right, five. Okay. Well, now we're getting some reaction for sure. Now it's turning pretty good. Kind of looking like grapefruit juice yep. now. So we're yep, looking for a little, get there. little bit more orange than that. Yeah. Brian, do you have the book uh, for this, yes, the yes, book that came with it? Yes, I do. Because right, right at the top of that page, they have the color. Oh, okay. I see it. Right. right. Yep. Yep. So, so right. you can see, you can match that. Right there. Behind the, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, there you go. That's the color that we're looking for. Okay, that orange brown. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, that's helpful that they did that. I didn't even realize that. Yeah. All right, so let's see. This is number six. All right. And now it's looking like... Uh, now it's looking like uh, East Texas or Oklahoma River water. <laughs> yeah. Six looks like it's going to be it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too, because based on seeing... That looks pretty... Pretty, I know it's hard to see on the camera there, but uh, it looks pretty close to it. Yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's orange for sure. Yeah. So it looks like six. It is. Yeah, the brown orange. Mm-hmm. Looks like it's okay. So like a there's no sunrise. conversions necessary. These values. <laughs> 
All right. So that one that one is is what it is. So it's six. We're going to multiply that by 10. That would be, so 60. be 60. So we still have to multiply it by 10. Okay. So 60 and that is what what is that uh, figure? That measurement. That was chloride. So okay. 60 parts per million of chloride. All right. Okay. All right. Now we got a sulfate test next. Now what we want to Yeah, or... the sulfate test. Okay. Now this is probably the hardest one to do because you have to compare your water sample, such a small sample, with the sheet that right there that you're picking out behind the their camera. So right. what you want to do is set your test sample over the right hand side of the target and then compare it with what you see on the left hand side. Okay. So if you have, let's say, 150 parts per million of sulfate, when you look directly down in the tube after the tablet's dissolved, it will come out looking gray. Okay. Um, so that makes yeah, sense. So it's a, yeah, it does. It makes sense. But it also, they're only separated by 50 parts per million. What was interesting was a conversation with the gentleman who had talked with the Brew Lab guys because he had a value or what he observed was somewhere in between what they show you. So zero and 50 parts per million versus okay. 100 parts per million. It was somewhere in between 50 and 100. And so he said, well, is it okay to sort of, you have to guesstimate if the sulfate is you know, 35 or 45, depending on how close one way or the other it is you come. And they wrote back and said, yes, that's totally uh, acceptable. Uh, that's exactly what we hope people would do is take a look at that and be able to have a visual assumption and determine, you know, if it was in fact, like 75, because you can tell the difference if it's between 50 and 100, okay. how much you're, you have to sort of deduce. Now, when it comes time to actually add in your salt additions, if you think about it when you're making beer, well, how close does it have to be? Right. I mean, if you're going to get like, in that case, if you're brewing a, a pale ale and you want to get, you know, a two to one ratio or a three to one chloride to sulfate ratio, then that's more what you're thinking about. If you have to figure out, well, if I'm going to add in 250 parts per million or 275 parts per million, the flavor con um, consequences are not going to be huge, you know, right. between those 25 different parts per million. Right. I got you. So this is where a little bit of guesswork comes into play. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, one of the values where a, um, a lab water report might be, more reliable but again in terms of what are the effects not that huge right yeah so if you're making if you make an adjustment one way or the other it's not as big of a deal it doesn't have to be super precise now you're gonna get it in the ballpark yeah yeah so I've, I've added the tablet and I'm waiting on it to dissolve here um, let's yeah. see. you can put the tap the tap on it the top on it and it's uh, okay, swish it around shake it a little bit okay Hey everybody! <laughs> it's definitely uh, getting a little bit uh, cloudy. Uh, let me see if I'll show the on the other camera here. If you can see how it's kind of cloudy in there, and that will affect how it looks when I'm looking through. When I look through this, you're going to put it over top of there, and then that'll affect how it looks as when I look down through it. So, unfortunately, this camera That's doesn't right. tilt all the. I could. I can't get it to look all the way straight down. I tried, but you'll have to just believe me. Oh, we're still not quite all dissolved yet, so I need to do that. To... Yeah, this was uh, that tablet's the, one of the ones that takes the longest to dissolve. Yeah, it doesn't like to dissolve, that's for sure. All right. Hey, Stefan Brig. Hey, Brian. Uh, thrash Metal Trent. I see Tom is still here with us. Brian Harkin. Hey, Brian, how are you? Thanks for uh, putting up with the test today. We kind of wanted to go through this and kind of explain a little bit more about what we're going to talk about later. Uh, man, it's still not uh, still not all dissolved. Uh, 
Yeah, no kidding, Brian. I'm glad you could make it too. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I think I think I about got it. It's uh, yeah. definitely a real pain. That's for sure. Yeah, now I think uh, I think we about got it now. So, all right, let me take a look over the look over the uh, tube here. I'm probably somewhere between zero and fifty. I'm thinking. Now, this is where you have to guesstimate. If you're closer to fifty, then would you say it's like thirty-five or forty-five? Yeah, probably, probably somewhere. Yeah, I'm gonna say probably forty, because it's not that far off of. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. I'm gonna shine a light down in here. Yeah, it's probably. Wait a minute. Let me look at this. Having this light helps quite a bit because it lights up everything equally. Yeah, I think it's probably about 45 from what I'm seeing. Something like that. All right. So there's that. Okay. Yeah, that's probably one of the hardest ones to do. So yeah, because it's, it's kind of subjective. Are with... able to... yeah. So from that, um, yeah, it's a little bit subjective, like you just said. So mm -hmm. you wanted to mark that off as about 40, 45, you said? Yeah, I'd say, we'll say 45. And that was uh, sulfate? Mm -hmm. That was sulfate, yes. Okay, PPM, okay. That would be about 40. First million. Alrighty. Hey, Henry. All right. So then the next uh, is our alkalinity. Is that right? Total alkalinity comes next. Yes. Okay. All right. I noticed you said total total alkalinity. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that one is going to be. So this one we use the same vial from it, test to test, right? That's right. Yeah. The bigger. 715 vial okay. uh, the plastic one that comes with the cap you can right. just leave the cap off okay we'll fill that one and up then the we're going to add in the yep 25 milliliters of water all right and then we'll add in three drops of the total alkalinity indicator which will turn it the solution green okay let me uh turn our lab camera back on here all right so then we've got uh total alkalinity indicator okay and that is the part number 2786 okay very good all right so three drops of that yes okay we're going to be getting to some questions here in just a little bit we're we're getting pretty close to the end of the test here so all right one two three okay isn't that pretty? Like a turquoise color. I'm telling you, this this water kit, it, the, you know, for the effects that you get, it's worth the price. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you think you're a scientist or something. <laughs> right, uh, right. Awesome. And I'm not being endorsed at all for this product. Yeah, right, it's exactly. Just, uh, <laughs> I enjoy it that much. Yeah. I know he's a water he's a water geek, ladies and gentlemen, or a water nerd. One of the two. I don't know. Okay, so then we're going to go for the uh, the good old sulfuric acid. We are uh, just a quick little note that uh, I know some people had commented on this in the past where they said I thought it was supposed to be green, but it looked more uh, turquoise uh, than green. And in fact, it does come out looking a little bit more turquoise than green, but that's okay. At least you get the color. Uh, indicator set and it's you know saturated to what it is so that right now what we're going to be doing is adding in the sulfuric acid which will then change the color from whatever it is to red and that will be pretty clear uh, once we do it so yeah and just a quick note on if it on doesn't this... look that green <laughs> go ahead 
Uh, if it doesn't look as as green as what uh, the green as they show in the booklet, I mean, don't let that alarm you. This is what it should look like, and that's totally fine. And just a quick note on this particular chemical, it is very caustic or basically will burn the crap out of you, so you don't want to drop it on your skin. Um, just when you use it, just be careful. Make sure you get the lid back on tight. And if you have any children, that you store it somewhere up high where they can't get to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. One drop at a time. So we got one, and then we're going to swirl. One drop at a time. The sulfuric acid, 7748. Let it set for a second. Two drops. Not seeing any real change to it yet. Does it happen pretty quick, Tony, with right. this this particular test? When well, that one, that yeah. Point? You'll see with the next one. With the third one, it will start to change, okay. and it will hold there for half a second or so, and then it will change back, and cool. you know you're getting a little bit close. All right, very yeah. good. Three. Yeah. This one, I think, is a, a little bit uh, better in terms of there's no purple. You know, you don't sort of need right. to deduce it. It's, it's a clear difference between what this color is, the, the green aqua. Right. Versus the, the red that you before. Okay, so that was three and we've got no change, so we'll have to go four. Yeah. Hmm. Not really changing yet. There you go. You saw it for half a second. Yeah, I thought I saw it, it turn a little right bit. Back. Yep. I thought I saw it turn a little bit. All right. <laughs> LSD show. Yeah, Trent. <laughs> hey, Chris O. Glad you're enjoying the uh, the test tube play here. <laughs> All right. Uh, five. Oh, there we go. It's not going to stay, though, I don't think. Kind of a purple color now. So we're looking for more of a straight up red, though, right, Tony? We are. It'll be more of a, a brighter red, closer okay. to uh, the red that you have down at the bottom of that pH okay. 401 buffer. Okay. All right. But uh, that's that's a clear color change. I mean, that's a color change right there. Yeah. So you know, you may want to call it five. Okay. If you go one more drop, which you have plenty, mm -hmm. so you could add one more drop. Okay. And see if it does become a more brilliant red. And if okay. it does, well, then you could call it like 55. Okay. Because it's no longer that aqua color. Yeah, there it, it turned uh, that's now it's, clear. Now it's red. It's red now. And now, yeah, now you get red like that pH 4 buffer. Mm -hmm. yep. And so, boom. If you want to call it 55 or 60. I mean, yeah, probably either between the two because it you're, changed you're, the color already once. I mean, it, it did change the color, so you're right in the bulb. Yeah, yeah, and that is our uh, let's just alkalinity. That's your total alkalinity. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's call that sixty, and okay. let's just swap the screen back over. Okay. To uh, all right, here we go. The booklet. <laughs> All right. So at 25 uh, milliliters, multiply that by 10, which will give us the 60 parts per million. Okay. As uh, uh, 60 parts per million as calcium carbonate. And okay. That's going to be the total alkalinity. Now, some calculators you can actually use total alkalinity as calcium carbonate. Okay. But some actually prefer you to have them as HCO3. Okay. So in order to get the HCO3 values, then what you want to do is take the, the 60 and multiply that by 1.2, and then that will give you 72. Okay. So 72 is the value that you use for HCO3. HCO3, all right. All righty. And then uh, now we go on to the hardness test, and do we... Well, 
Or we already if did you want to know what your residual alkalinity is, now you can do that. And uh, the residual alkalinity, we can talk a little bit more about it. Um, okay. The residual alkalinity being, uh, if it's a a plus value, uh, it will give you an indication that when you add grains into your water, whether or not the pH is going to raise or lower and how much. Okay. Um, how much alkalinity is left in the water after all of the calcium and magnesium is. Okay. So then uh, should you know, we, what, what uh, test should we proceed? with the other ions. What test should we proceed to after this? After this comes the sodium. So then it comes the calculations based on all of the other values that we've uh, received so far. Okay. So for the residual alkalinity, um, you want to take the total alkalinity, Hi. subtract that from... Oh, Sorry about there that. We go. <laughs> Kelly had to say hi before she walked out the door. <laughs> All right. So the for totally the fine. for the residual alkalinity. Yeah, this is not actually something that you're gonna type into too many calculators because okay. they'll actually tell you what your residual alkalinity is. Okay. But if you wanted to know it just to know what it is ahead of time, then you could do this. Uh, do basically, calc? take your calcium hardness. Okay. Um, Plus add that, that to number. Your magnesium times 0.5, so half of your magnesium. So calcium hardness plus half of your magnesium hardness. Divide that by 3.5. Okay. And that gives you your and residual. Whatever, no, that whatever that value is, you're going to subtract uh, that from your total alkalinity. Oh, okay. And that will give you your residual alkalinity. Okay. All right. Again, uh, not going to be used on most of the calculators. Most of the calculators will tell you what that is okay. afterwards. All right. But coming down here to the sodium. So we don't need that in order to figure out what our sodium is. Okay. Uh, sodium is basically we're going to deduce what the sodium is based on all of the other main ions are in our water. So okay. if you think about the water having a TDS or total dissolved solids in it, the only solids that we're really interested in at this point are the ones that we've tested. So your hardness, okay. your chloride, your sulfate, and the alkalinity. And using those four, we can deduce what your sodium is. So it's kind of get you in the ballpark figure. I have a, a website uh, that I want to share. Okay. Um, it's a calculator here. All right. Let me see Back up. And I'll, I'll put this uh, in the description, the, the, a link to it in the video description once we're done here yeah. uh, so that you guys can it's use it. It's just um, yates.me, so y8s.me slash sodium sheet. Okay. Bring that down so people could be able to see that. Yeah, it's a little hard to see because it's so, so small, but we'll put a link. Yeah. So I'll just go to that. And we can type in our values. It's a, uh, a Google sodium calculator sheet that I have here. Can you uh, zoom in on that just a little everybody? bit, Tony? You bet. Should be able to. Uh, view. Fifty. There we go. How's That's that? better. That's better. Okay. So with this, then we just have to take in the values that we had for our total hardness. And then also the values that we had for our calcium hardness was at 70. Uh-huh. Okay. And then it will auto-calculate what our magnesium hardness was, 40. And then give us the parts per million here. You can see the 28 and the 9.6. Uh-huh. And down below, or over on the right, sorry, uh, the chloride. What was your chloride? Uh, chloride was 60. 60. And then the sulfate? Uh, that was 45. Okay. 
And total alkalinity? Uh, that was the last number that we did, right? 72? Oh, no, 60. Okay, and then you can see over here the sodium being the, the result of that calculation, 37.99. You could say 38, that should be fine. But as 37.99, you can see our ion balance is 0 0.01, which is what you want. You want to get this ion balance as close as possible to zero. Okay. Basically meaning that your water report is balanced. Right. So you have the right amount of the same amount of cations as you do for your anions and so that, that then this will basically validate or verify that your water report is correct for your water source so then you could write down your sodium uh, value for 37.99 i just made it 38 to make it easy mm. great and coming back to the, the the water report so basically that water calculator just takes the chloride the okay. sulfate the alkalinity uh, figures out that for your negative ions or your anions, and then you use your total hardness to calculate your cations, and that will tell you what your sodium value is, or your sodium, which is also part of your cations. Okay. All right. So, so then, that's it. And then go ahead. The last thing to do uh, with this is to figure out your pH. Right. And then you have that pH meter. Yep. So I just so happened to have one right here and let me uh, switch over to the view here uh, all right so i've got uh this is the eco tester ph2 model and this is actually i, I was looking through some literature in the uh, lamont brew labs and this was one of the testers that they had recommended before they came out with their own um so i'll go ahead and uh turn this thing on and we'll uh do a ph test I've got a little is there a particular, I mean, do you, do you need a bigger, does a sample just need to cover the, the, uh, the, I don't know, what is it called? Not the electrode. What is the, what is it called? The sensor? Well, yeah, is? it is. The, oh, you know, yeah, but the electrode. So okay. on the end of the uh, pH meter, yeah. Okay. All right. You bet. Okay. So we'll, got a sample here of water and we'll drop this in there and swirl it around a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see here. Let me uh, get my light here. Turn it just a little bit more to the left. I think you can see it now. Let's see. There you go. Yeah. 7.5. So there's what my pH is. It's, it was calibrated yeah. uh, like about a week ago. So I feel like it's... Uh, good as far as the numbers go and that's uh another thing too if you you want to talk to them about cal uh calibrating the their ph meter if they get one yeah i was just gonna say uh something about that when you just said that okay i calibrated this about a week ago and really it's gonna be based on your experience because as i understand it different ph meters will hold their calibration for different periods of time mm -hmm. so I, I calibrate mine pretty much every brew day okay. uh, when I test my water ahead of time. So, uh, but then again, that's like once or twice a month normally. So that's okay. If you're using your pH meter every day, then you can, if you're calibrating it every week, you can see how far out of calibration it becomes. And of course you're gonna wanna calibrate it as much as is required in order to get consistent values based on your readings. Right. So, um, and, and they make a couple of different, uh, calibration solutions. The one, the two that I use is seven and four. Uh, they make a, I mean, I, I guess they make more than that even, but another level would be 10. Um, but do you, you calibrate yours between that seven and four as well, or what do you usually? The reason why, yeah, the reason why is because you have four, you have seven, you have 10. And the reason why most brewers only calibrate between four and seven is because the water that you're actually testing is between those values. Okay. Now, if you were doing some sort of water analysis and your water was more often than not between seven and 10, then you would want to use the seven and 10 calibration 
in order to get it, uh, you know, tighter calibrations okay. within that range. Yeah, so if you had a higher pH so it was over 7, it, then you'd want to calibrate it between those two numbers rather than a 4 and a 7. Right. Makes sense. I have a Milwaukee uh, 102, and when you're doing a calibration, it will say, you know, start off at 4, then you calibrate to 7, and then you can calibrate to 10 afterwards. But you don't have to calibrate right. to 10. You can just reset it at that time, and then you're ready to go after the 4 and 7. And that's the same it is for uh, all of the other uh, pH meters out there, the digital pH okay. meters. You can calibrate it between the 4 and 7. That'll be um, within the range, the most accurate for within the range that you're going to be using it for. Yeah, and this one's interesting because it, it just uh, – you, you put it in the solution, the 4, and then when it reaches 4, you just hit enter. It locks in that figure, and then when you know you put it in the seven, and when it reaches seven, you hit that figure. You know when you when it stabilizes, you hit that. You know set set that in. Sometimes you know like I've seen it where it'd be, you know four point three or four, and then when you hit when you set it, it'll it'll adjust it down to to four. But uh, it's it's pretty basic. But I mean it's it worked pretty worked really well for me. Uh, I haven't used it a ton, but um, yeah, <laughs> it uh, it works pretty well. So yeah, Trent Pizza. I've somebody had three ordered. different pH meters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had three different pH meters, and each one of the calibration procedures were different. Yeah. So that's what kind of makes it hard in terms of the, the pH meters. Is mm -hmm. You can't just assume that the calibration is going to be performed a certain way. Each right. one is slightly different. Consult your it's manufacturer's read, instructions. You have to read them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get into, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people are watching this and their head's kind of swimming. I know, you know, I know a little bit about it and mine is kind of like Ooh, <laughs> doing all this stuff. So let's kind of let's uh, talk about, OK, now that we have the numbers, um, what do we do to put that into practice? And maybe we could look at um, so like, let's say with my water profile and we don't have it plugged into a calculator at all, but just looking at the quick overview that you see what would be like an initial first step for me to start for doing like an IPA? Well, I'll take you through what I would do. Okay. So using your values, let's go ahead and plug those into a calculator and apply what we've just learned. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over uh, over into the screen and I'll try and bump up the uh, resolution for you. Okay. Yeah, see if you can scroll a little bit to the yeah, there a uh, little bit more if you can. Over here. There we go. Yep. Trying to get the center. Pretty good now. Okay. Hmm. So this is uh, John Palmer's Brew and Water Adjustment app, which is what I'll initially use just to sort of get the values in in a ballpark. Um, I really like this one best because you choose a different beer style, and these are all the BJCP styles that are out there. If I choose a different style it automatically gives me the recommended uh, water ion concentrations for that beer style. And each one of these recommendations are straight up out of his book. So I think it's a win-win. It's, it's for free. It's available for download on his website, howtobrew.com. Uh, we can post a link to that later in the description of this video. Uh, so then we go down to step number two here, and that's where we put in our source water data. So if you'll read me off the, the, the values that you had for calcium as okay. milligrams per liter. Okay, that was uh, 70 parts per minute. Wait a minute, because uh, we did the conversion on it. It was 70, and then we wound up with uh, 28 is what, it's, what uh, we wound up right, with. 28. Actually, I have them. Sorry, I have them right here okay. behind me, <laughs> <laughs> so I can just go ahead and pick those off there. So yeah. Right. So knowing what those values are, I get twenty-eight uh, parts per million for the calcium, and I have a nine point six for the magnesium. The alkalinity here, you can select either as calcium carbonate or the bicarbonate values. So this is going to be total alkalinity, and our total alkalinity that was. 60, if I'm not mistaken, let me move that. Yep, 60. Sulfate was 45. Sorry, I keep moving that around. It's all right. Nobody's getting sick watching this. Yeah, they're all seasick now. Chloride <laughs> was 60. 
Sodium was 37.99. Michael Great. Smith says the he loves your water series, is... by the way, Tony. Hmm. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, so then I set the water pH 7.5. Okay. And here's what I like about John, uh, you know, calculator right there up in the front tells me that the cations and the anion summary equals each other. So the it's a balanced water report. Okay. Gives me my uh, residual alkalinity right there as 34. So then I know if I put in just some base grains into a, a solution, then uh, that will determine, actually the residual alkalinity in the past used to be used as a, uh, a way to guesstimate what's the best beer style or beer color that I could target. Um, but that's not necessarily the, the true anymore. Mm -hmm. And then again, based on my water ions, what's my current sulfate to chloride ratio? Uh, get into other things, but I'm, I don't wanna get into the details of this water report your question was basically, once I have these values, right. mm -hmm. how do I go ahead and start to use these values in such a way that makes sense? So now I have my water report values from the Brew Lab uh, test kit. So then I want to punch those into this calculator. And you asked me, let's go ahead and make an IPA. Is that right? An Correct. IPA yep. Yep. That's you know that's a popular style. So you know let's let's talk about you know what are we what are we doing to adjust it so that we get okay. a good outcome. <clears throat> so based on that, then I come up to the top mm -hmm. and I'll see what John recommends for uh, that style. So what are the ions that we're targeting? So and he has the BJCP so get, styles like, uh, in there. Yep. Okay. So find IPA, American IPA. Mm -hmm. So Based on his recommendations, 50 to 150 parts per million uh, as guidance for magnesium, anywhere between 0 and 30. Okay. Alkalinity between 4 and 120. Sulfate between 1 and 400. Chloride 0 to 100. Sodium less than 100. And alkalinity anywhere between minus 30 and plus 30. So looking at our residual alkalinity, our residual alkalinity, or Brian's, your residual mm -hmm. alkalinity coming out at 34, then you're just a little bit above that, which basically means that uh, the pH, your mash pH may be a little bit too high okay. for this style. Your your beer or your water might be a little bit too high in, um, in terms of alkalinity for this beer style. So you're probably going to want to use maybe a little bit of acid malt yep. or a little bit of acid in your water to bring that residual alkalinity down within that range mm -hmm. somewhere between negative 30 and plus 30. And I mean, that's exactly what I find that I have to do is, is use some, uh, I usually use lactic acid uh, to bring that uh, residual alkalinity down. Um, Cause I don't, I don't use a lot of crystal malts in my IPAs usually. Um, I do use, yep. you know, some other malts for color, but uh I don't use as, as many uh, crystal malts as some people do, <clears throat> but I definitely do have to adjust the pH okay. down because I'm still, usually when I plugged it into brewing water that I used before, I would be somewhere around 7.6 or something like 7.5, 7.6, something like that. Um, and, you know, okay. that, so I would have to adjust it a little bit. So, yeah. So. so this is where it comes down to personal preference. So now you need to sort of make some... Uh, make some judgment calls. You need to say, okay, um, I know that for good brewing water, my calcium has to be at least 50. So then you're going on the other ions and you say, okay, if I want my calcium to be at least 50, but less than 150, okay, I can get there. How do I get there? Well, the main contributors for those things are your calcium sulfate and your calcium chloride um, salts. And then there's also things like calcium uh, hydroxide. You don't want to use that though in this bit, in this case because that would raise your residual alkalinity because that actually raises your alkalinity. Kind of counteract so what you're trying to do anyways. You using this. <clears throat> right? Yeah, it's going to counteract what you're trying to do. So you know that you're gonna you're gonna basically come back down. And you're going to use either calcium chloride or uh, calcium sulfate in order to raise that calcium level up. So that's going to push up your cal your sulfate levels and your chloride levels simultaneously. 
Um, so you know that. So once you put that, uh, dial that in, well, then you kind of need to come up with an idea about, well, what do I want my sulfate and chloride values to be? Um, you know, how, how dry do I want this IPA? Uh, which will determine if you're going to add in more sulfate uh, or, or chloride. You know, if you want it to be you know, more malt focused, more like a, maybe towards the English IPA side, then mm -hmm. you may want to have those, those a little bit more balanced, a little bit okay. more towards the, the one to one ratio. But for an American IPA, most people go for a, uh, a two to one or a three to one calcium to sulfate ratio. So then basically what I would do is go in and start plugging in the values uh, for how much salt I would add that would then result in my calcium being higher than 50 and then coming up with a sulfate to chloride ratio where I need to determine how much sulfate I want in my beer. So I probably don't want to go to the extreme of 400. Yeah. Um, so if I set a, a medium threshold and say, okay, how about 200? Let's just start off with 200, somewhere right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then I'll try and dial in my chloride for 100. So then I would have a two to one ratio. And right. I could try that beer and brew that beer with that style. And then I know my calcium would be at the right level. My chloride to sulfate ratio would be two to one. And based on the results of that, uh, after fermentation and carbonation, I taste that beer. Then I could start to make adjustments for the next time I make that beer and say, okay, it wasn't quite dry enough. Uh, I want to be able to accentuate the, the dryness and crispness a little bit more. So I'm going to bump that up to three uh, sulfate versus the one chloride ratio. Right, yeah, and, and, and I found that you start one, tweaking it. From yeah, there. once I started doing that, once I uh, bumped, the, I think the highest I've gone on IPA has been like 300 parts per million of the sulfate, and then just right around 100 on the uh, chloride. And you know, I found that it was a it was a, a really good balance of you know because it it also accentuates some of the hop bitterness too. I found, um, you know, with having the sulfates a little bit higher like that, so. That was my IPs were IPAs were flat for a long time. Like I mean, I, you know, I would calculate 70, 80 IBUs, and I'm like, it doesn't taste like there's any hops in it at all. And then once I started making those adjustments to water, it really started to dial in that hop bitterness where you know I was picking it up, and it was it was much more prominent than it was before adding doing the additions. Yeah, you get those uh, the hops really get to pop mm -hmm. when they get above the between 200 and 300. Uh, PPM for the sulfate. Right. Another great way to uh, get basically where you you think you want to go based on a beer that you really like is go back and try and find a um, an episode in like a Sunday session. You know, the the Brewing Network interviews all of the different uh, breweries across America, and a lot of the time the brewers will share with you what their water profile is oh. for maybe that, that beer that you really really like. And so if you can pick up on that and get that water profile or tune into some of the things that they're doing in the brewery in order to produce those award-winning beers, then you can go ahead and uh, dial that in as well. Awesome. Well, we, uh, we actually cultivated some questions, uh, Facebook, Instagram, some other ones. Um, let's take one of, let's look at one of those questions and then uh, we'll open up for some questions on the live chat. And kind of just uh, go back and forth between the two. Um, one of the questions that I got was, uh, what's a good water profile? I guess you kind of just answered this, but uh, what's a, a good water profile and pH for a West Coast IPA? I've heard sulfate to chloride ratios anywhere from 2 to 1 all the way up to 9 to 1. I, I guess we talked about the 2 to 1. What what do you think about the 9 to 1? No, I think that's a great question. Uh, I've never done a nine to one i've done a six to one and i've found that that uh came out minerally but then again i was targeting i think like 350 parts per million of sulfate hmm. uh versus a much lower uh one of chloride so okay. uh yeah that came out uh, minerally to me hmm. but then again it comes back to different people have different tastes right so what tastes minerally to me might be fantastic or terrible to somebody else. So it really right. comes into being able to, for you to determine what you want to dial it in at. For me personally, uh, I found that uh, around uh, four to one is probably my favorite. Um, 
again, coming back, listening to uh, uh, podcast, Bruin podcast, and people sharing water profiles. Um, probably one of the most common that I see for pale ales are around two and a half to three to one for sulfate to chloride. And for um, Manta Ray, for example, for the, uh, the, the um, who's that brewery in San Diego? They sold out. Uh, oh, yeah. They make the Manta Ray. Mm. Uh, same one with the Grapefruit Sculpin. Who does the Sculpin? Here's, doesn't uh, matter. The, Those guys. Yeah. They did the, the Manta Ray. And I know that that one's a 4.5 to 1. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. For sulfate to chloride. Okay. So if you're looking to make a, an IPA or a double IPA with the same type of crispness and dryness that you get from a manta ray, then you probably want to go and try and target a 4.5 to 1. Thank now, you, whether Brian. Or it's not ballast that point. 4.5 <laughs> of sulfate, yeah, whether or not that's 300 or 350 uh, of the sulfate versus whatever the, the chloride for that would be, I can't tell you because you didn't share that information. Mm hmm but at least you gave me the ratio and you can, you know, do a couple test brews in order to figure that out. Sure, sure. Another thing that you can do when you're trying to figure these things out is uh, a lot of the times people ask me, and uh, when is the right time to add the salts? Mm, yeah, that's another, I think that and, is a question that we had. Mm. Okay. Mm. And, and that basically comes out to be, uh, you, you want to get enough calcium into the mash uh, so in order to uh, get the best efficiency that you can with the, the conversion and all of the, the things that are involved with that. So what you want to uh, get the calcium to the right level, at least 50 parts per million for the mash. Um, and then you can save the rest for adding directly into the boil. If you want to add it to your sparge water, that's fine too. If you want to add it directly to the boil, that's fine too. And, you know, you can take some of that wort that you've boiled, and if you want to do a split batch, for example, and say, in, in one fermenter, I want to have one that is uh, all of them, let's say you want all of them to be uh, 4.5 to 1 for this IPA, but you want different volumes or different parts per million uh, in each one. So one will be like 350, the other one will be 250 uh, of sulfate, then you can go ahead and just add in the salts uh, for that later um, while you're boiling, take out some more, okay. you know, um, uh, dissolve your salts into that. And then after you've put it into your fermenter, then add that directly into your fermenter into the one that you want with the more salts in it so that then you can taste or test that out later. Okay. So, so you don't have to just put it in the mash. I mean, that's usually where I do it. So, but yeah, that, that's a great point. If you want to try to, if you want to experiment, you know, with, with one and maybe, and maybe, you know, you do push it to, you push it to the limit of, you know, what you think it should be. And, and, you know, maybe you take off, you know, of a five gallon match, maybe take off three gallons and leave two and then, you know, just go really hog wild with that last two gallons and maybe overdo it a little bit, but then at least, you know, where that ceiling is at and experiment and find out, okay, I'm not going that high. <laughs> Yeah, the most important thing at that point is to just make sure that you can uh, have it, um, you know, sterilized so that it doesn't uh, infect anything after right. post boil and post cooling. But again, uh, coming back to the point, that question about you know, when do you add the salts, and it's going to be different for different people. Um, for example, uh, people that are using the Braumeister or the Grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, they're using a majority of their water or they could be using all of their water during the mash and then you just take it out and maybe do a no sparge so if you're going to be doing a no sparge then you can go ahead and add in all of your salts into that initial uh, strike water because that's going to be it's there is no strike sparge it's it's all in one and that's another thing the brew in a bag so that fits the brew in a bag model as well so if you're not sparge in it all uh -huh. then you can go ahead and just add in all of your salts directly to that initial water source and that also for affects anybody your... that's sparging go ahead for anybody that's sparging then you want to go ahead and have a separate sparge volume set aside heat it up and then you can add in salts to match the water profile your mashing water profile okay with the same mash or the the water profile for the sparge water if you're going to be doing separately then you just have to uh, 
calculate the amounts of solid state that you're going to be using for the different volumes of water sources. And Brian, we'll get to your question in just a second. It's a good question, so I'll ask Tony about it. But um, and that just since you brought up the uh, grain father, um, I just wanted to uh, uh, with that system, you're going to affect your res you, like your re residual alkalinity and everything with your grains because you're you have more of a volume of water. Is it correct? Uh, I mean, because if you're if you mash like you would in a three, you know, a three vessel system like we have, we're calculating our mash water at a lower volume than what you're doing with a, a no sparge on like a Robo Brew or a Braumeister or whatever. Um, your water is buffering those chemicals that exist already in the grain a little bit, right? Well, the grains also have their uh, buffering uh, agents as well that mm -hmm. are being included into uh, your water. So, Yes, your water has certain buffering capacity, but then it's going to be increased as you're adding in the grains because those are adding in more buffering uh, ions that will add to those buffering agents. It doesn't change your residual alkalinity because your residual, residual alkalinity is a, it's just a value that's going to allow you to guesstimate whether or not after you've doed in and you're mashing, if your pH is going to need to be lowered or raised okay. in order to reach a target uh, water profile that you're looking for a uh, target alkalinity okay uh, um brian has a question uh, he says uh, tony i noticed in one of your brewing videos that you use phosphoric acid other, rather than lactic acid for your ph adjustment uh, other than the taste from the lactic acid is there another reason you use it and i know we talked about this while we were getting ready for this and it's very interesting so uh, answer that question no it's a common question and the answer is no, there's no difference. Uh, only other than the fact that if I had highly alkaline water and I needed to use more acid, then I would probably use phosphoric acid to uh, decrease it because it doesn't have any taste contributions. But because I don't need to use so much acid in order to reduce the pH as necessary for most of the brews, I could just as easily use lactic acid and not have to worry about any of the sour uh, taste contributions that it may give in, in higher concentrations. Okay. So that's really it. Phosphoric acid does come at a double-edged sword because you don't want to use it in uh, your water if the pH is higher than uh, uh, 5.6 uh, because if you're going to add it into your water with it, if the water has a pH higher than 5.6, it is going to decrease some of the hardness in that water as well. So it will precipitate some of the calcium out of it. So, so if you're going to target, bit. if you're using phosphoric acid, like my water source uh, coming out of the tap, so usually between 6.8 and uh, 7.2, and I'll bring it immediately down using the phosphoric acid down to 5.5. Um, so then I don't have to necessarily, I don't have to necessarily worry about it dropping any of the hardness out of the water because I'm bringing it right down to that 5.5 and it's you know going to be where I want it to be. If it was higher than that, 5.6, 5.8, and then I use that to strike or sparge with, then I may have to worry about some of the hardness uh, uh, dropping out or precipitating out. Okay, I got you. All right, let's uh, move on to one of our other questions that we had from, uh, this one looks like it comes from Instagram. Um, it's, uh, does a TDS meter give you enough info for adjustments or is a water profile needed? Uh, it's uh, Jambro 1964 and he says he's new to water adjustments and he's on uh, well water as a source. TDS reports do not give you enough because it doesn't tell you the two most important things that you need to know, and that would be what is your total hardness and what is your total alkalinity. These are like the main things that you want to know in order to apply those to a water report or to a, a brewing sheet so that you can figure out where your uh, water profiles uh, stand. Um, again, being your, your source water. And then that is the bare minimum that you need to know those two things in order to deduce what you're going to need to add to your water to reach your target water profile. So TDS reports don't give you a different, uh, different they don't differentiate between total alkalinity and total hardness. Um, if you have those two values, you can 
sort of fudge the numbers in any of the water calculators to bring you to where you want to be. Um, out of Greg Noonan's uh, Brewing Lager Beers book, you know, he said sort of a rule of thumb is that you can think about uh, getting the magnesium out of uh, uh, total alkalinity would be about 40%, um, anywhere between 35 and 40% of your total alkalinity. And that's really just a guesstimation. It's sort of like Einstein's uh, fudge number. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's never completely accurate, but it's a ballpark. I got so you. if you're dealing with just total alkalinity or total hardness, then yeah, you, can, you can fudge it a little bit. And then uh, based on the TDS value, you know, you can play with the other numbers for calcium, sulfate, and uh, sodium to get you in, in the ballpark of where you need to be. Okay. Uh, it's not totally accurate. So that's where I think a water report is necessary and a kit, whether it's this one or hatch or a different one, um, you'd, be, you'd be good off. I gotcha. Uh, uh, we got another question organic. from the live chat here. Uh, Chris O says, at what point is it better to use RO water as a blank slate to make adjustments? I guess, I'm, and I'm going to add lib, add on to his questions here, as opposed to just, you know, adjusting your tap water that comes in. Um, depends on how much work you want to do or have to do on your tap water. So if your tap water is extremely hard, mm -hmm. Um, or have a lot of um, temporary hardness, you, know, you, you may have to separate that out. So whether or not you use uh, um, two different ways in order to uh, eliminate the, the alkalinity, of mm -hmm. course, is to boil it off so that then you can precipitate out uh, some of that calcium carbonate, or you use slaked lime uh, in order to do the same thing, precipitate out that calcium carbonate, uh, get rid of the alkalinity and find out what your your final uh, hardness is, your permanent hardness in there that will then be used for your beer. Uh, so how much work do you wanna do is really the determinant factor. If you have really hard water or water with high alkalinity and you need to treat it, if you're lazy and you don't wanna treat it, then that's where using distilled water uh, deionized water or reverse osmosis water would uh, be your best friend. I got you. Uh, apologize, guys. Look like we, we lost the stream for just a second, but it's back. So uh, <laughs> I didn't lose Tony for whatever reason, but um, uh, I saw it drop off there and start buffering. So hopefully uh, we're, we're still here, but uh, we, we've made it so this far. So <laughs> they can't stop us now. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about the, the RO water uh, is that there's a couple of, there's a couple of things that you know I, my thoughts on it is you know you have a cost associated with the ro system um you know that could be prohibitive for some people um and then secondly if you live you know and somebody brought up california if you live in an area where you know you're limited to a certain amount of water uh you like a, you got a water shortage issue or whatever uh ro systems do Usually, you know, unless you have a super high efficient one, it's one for one. For one gallon of RO water, you're wasting another gallon of water. So, you know, you, you have the issue there um, with that. So that would be, you know, maybe one of the reasons where somebody would want to uh, try to adjust their water as opposed to buying an RO system if you got those, you know, uh, either a, a cost limitation or, you know, you're, you're restricted on how much water you can use. So that, you know, there's a couple of couple of things that I would say that, you know, might be an argument for trying to change your water more than just getting a, an RO system, which I'm, I'm looking at possibly getting one, but, you know, those are a couple of things that I've tried to take into account. Not that we're not on a water shortage or anything, but, um, you know, just the fact that it does waste water and that, you know, it, it, you are looking at, you know, I know there's some out there for 100, 200, 300, you know, you can, you can spend as much as you want on one, but those were a couple of the things that I wanted to, to, uh, take into account whenever I was making a decision on that. And I haven't really made a decision yet. So, um, let's... Well, while you're on that point, Brian, what I, isn't the average price for like a home, you know, temporary, not, not a full on home system, but if you're going to be using it just for brewing, isn't like the average price around a hundred, $150 on eBay or 
I think your uh, local sources. I think that's I was, about right. Yeah, about a hundred dollars. I think uh, one of the 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 guy, the uh, AJ, his brewery that I was at last week. I think he told me it was like a hundred. He's actually on right now. Um, uh, I think he said it was about a hundred, and he just said he waters his plants with the RO dis uh, discharge and uses it to clean and rinse. So, I mean, there is some uses for it that that you can do. So, you know, you don't have to just let it go down the drain. Um, hey, Cristiano. Well, so, go ahead. While we're on that, just uh, uh, throwing some numbers out there, just wanted to talk about that for a second. It's about a hundred bucks for a good pH beater. Uh, whether I, I, you know, people ask me what do I recommend. Well, I've used. You can see the ones that I've used on my uh, videos. It's a Hatch Pocket Pro Plus. That one was great. That was about 100 bucks, a little bit more, I think. Uh, nowadays, I'm using the Milwaukee 102 one, and that's great, too. Not a big fan of all the cables, but okay, that one works. And I had, like, a pH scan 30 before that. All of them worked fine. All all three of them were about 100 bucks, And, uh, you know, so that's that investment. Mm -hmm. It's about a hundred and bucks for this uh, water test kit for the brew lab test kit, All right? So there's there's a hundred bucks there, and that will allow you to do certain things about your water. And it's about a hundred bucks for a reverse osmosis <laughs> system. So whether which, whichever route you choose to go, it's about a hundred bucks. Yeah, I was but, gonna say it, it reminds yeah. me of when I worked at a Chevy dealership. Anytime somebody rolled in with a Corvette, it was like, okay, that's a hundred bucks. Whatever we're doing is a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh let's see uh aj has a question about um he, he asks isn't lactic uh consumed by yeast during fermentation i'm assuming he's meaning lactic acid that i actually don't know okay. um i haven't i don't remember reading that and i did read the yeast book uh i just don't remember that i know that yeast produce acid um, that's how the pH drops from 5.2, whatever it is, post-brew, uh, post-boil. You put it into the fermenter, the yeast produce a lot of different things, including acid, which drops the pH down to between 4.0 and 4.5 for a typical brew. Okay. Um, and this was, this was a question, another question that we had on Facebook um, and Brian Watts is asking it here as well. Um, he doesn't have a filter for his tap water. Uh, is it okay for him to use spring water? And I guess I want to kind of expound on his question a little bit more. Um, should he contact the manufacturer of the spring water and try to get a water report from them? You could, and they'd probably be more than willing to help you out with that. Um, I think some of the home brew sites uh, websites, the forums that are out there, you may have people that have already asked that question and answered that question. So that might be a place to go and and look up on the Bruin Water, the brewersfriend.com website. They had all the, uh, the water source, water profiles for all the different places around the world. You may actually find water suppliers in that list as well. Okay. Um, I know that when I buy water over here, um, we were in Rome uh, last year, and we, you know, I bought some bottled water in the store, and I actually had the water report right there on the bottle, hmm. which was uh, very useful. Yeah, I'm that's I'm surprised that you you may not have that in the in the U.S. Um, so the water profiles that you get from different water suppliers, uh, spring water, are going to be different. Uh, you can pretty much be guaranteed about that. Um, so yeah, you'll definitely want to ask that if you don't know or are able to get it any other way. Uh, tap water uh, without a filter, um, basically the only thing you want to be worried about there is, you, of course, you want to know what your values are, you want to know what your ions are, uh, but in addition to that is the chlorine, of course. So first and foremost, get rid of the chlorine because that's going to be probably the number one uh, killer for anybody getting started. If you don't get rid of the chlorine, it's almost guaranteed to make uh, beer with the off flavors. And that kind of so, piggybacks onto a question that Brian had asked earlier. Um, what What is the process that you go through to remove the chlorine from your water, and what uh, What would you recommend? You know, so what are I guess what do you do, and then what are some of the other things that somebody can do? You know, filtration, Camden tablets. What What uh, What do you recommend on that? 
Those are probably the two highest recommended ways to go. I use a carbon filter. Uh, so I pass all my water through a carbon filter before it goes into the HLT. Um, the key thing to know about using a carbon filter is that you, you don't want to go full board on it. Uh, so you want to baby just trickle it through so they get maximum contact time to get rid of that chlorine as it's passing through the charcoal filter. When it comes to uh, the Camden tablets, you know, that's probably the easiest way. Uh, you just fill up the HLT or whatever uh, vessel that you have that's going to contain all of the water that you're going to use for the brew day, throw in a Camden tablet, and that will cause reactions within the water itself to get rid of the chlorine. Uh, the water reactions, the, the chemical reactions will occur, and then the chlorines, uh, things will just uh, dissolve and float away. Okay. Very good. So those are basically the two easiest ways. Of course, the third other way is that you can boil, and that will boil off the chlorine. Uh, there's a the, the lazy man's way of taking all the, the water that you're going to use into a vessel and then just leave the lid off it for 24 hours, and then the chlorine will naturally evaporate. Uh, evolve away. Okay. I don't, yeah, evaporate. I don't think that that will get rid of the chloramine, but okay. the chlorine will. Okay. So there's other things to think about too. I'm not, I'm not a chlorine expert there, but uh, in the first water video I did put out on the site, it contains a link to uh, uh, AJ DeLang uh, has a great paper on how to get rid of chlorine in your water. And uh, so I linked to that one. Okay. Um, we have another question that came from uh, Shallow Seas Brewing on Instagram, and he wanted to know the differences or benefits of lactic acid over acidulated malt. Well, uh, they both have lactic acid, and they both use lactic acid in order to reduce the pH in the water. So you can either use lactic acid directly and the nice thing about it is it comes in a nice little vial that you can just throw in a couple drops. Each milliliter will generally drop it down uh, in, a, in a five gallon vessel of water, about 0.1 uh, pH uh, for each milliliter. So that, that's really nice and easy, uh, really rule of thumb. Uh, acidulated malts, uh, well, in addition to the lactic acid benefit, you also get to be able to use some of the the starches from that malt, uh, if you want to be able to include that. So if you're using kit beers and just malt extract, whether dry or liquid, then uh, lactic acid drops may be the best way to go because obviously you're not using grains. But if you're doing all grain, then lactic acid malt or acidulated malt might be the best way to go for you. It's really a personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's the exact same acid type in both cases. Okay. I gotcha. Um, so let's uh, take another look at the question from uh, online. And I think we might have talked about, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I had a little bit of a question about it as well. Uh, same same person asking the question, uh, best time to add salts. I, I usually add my salts um, whenever I do my mash in. I know just a minute ago you said you could add them, you know, post boil even. Um, what do you do? you know, when you add your salts and, and is, is there any downside to adding them at a different time other than in the mash? I don't think that there's a downside to it. Um, for the mash, again, you want to get the calcium levels up there. Uh, when you add in the grains, that's going to add in more of the uh, other ions. It's going to add in more calcium. It's going to add in actually more sulfate and chloride and chlorine and alkalinity along with you because uh, I'm going to drill down a little bit of a rabbit hole first here really quickly <laughs> because um, I was um, reading a, a, a report. Actually, if you listen to the American um, the Brewers Association podcast, and I'm a member of the Brewers Association, not American Home Brewers Association. I am a member of them as well, but also the Brewers Association, so you can go out and listen to the quarterly uh, articles and things like that, the technical quarterlies. And those are really good. And there's a nice article in, in the last about uh, testing the waters from the different manufacturers and what the contributions are in terms of the malts for the water profiles. 
And it's amazing to think that whether or not you're ordering malts from Best Malts or Wireman's or uh, Simpson's or Thomas Fawcett's, if you think about it, how do they make malt? Well, they're, they're taking the grains before they put them in their roasters or their uh, the other vessels that they use to kiln the malts, the kilns or the roasters, uh, you know, they're, they're sprouting uh, the, the malts. <laughs> I've read the malt book, but I forget the terminology for each step of the process. But basically, they're using water in order to sprout uh, the, the malts. And then ba once that's process done, like three or four day process, once that's done, then they go ahead and put them in the kilns or the roasters uh, based on their targets. But even for the base malts, um, they are now soaked in a water source. And that water source has total hardness or hardness contributions. It has sodium, it has chloride, it has uh, uh, sulfate contributions that are now in those grains. And so different water suppliers are gonna, or different mold suppliers are gonna have, based on the different water profiles, are gonna affect the grains in different ways. And when you use those malts in your water profile, that's going to offset the end result um, as well. So if you're going to be using Simpson's Pale Malt in one beer, and then a month later, uh, you're, even though your water profile hasn't changed, but now you're using Wireman's Malt's uh, Pale Malt, uh, your mash pH may end up in a different location because of the ion contributions that came from each one of those pale malts based on those suppliers waters that were used to produce those malts yeah okay. i started to see where we were going so down that rabbit hole the there <laughs> i started yeah. to see where we were going i'm so like oh to... yeah that's right they do soak it in water and then you know and then uh, they they you know just start to generate the endosperm and all that stuff inside of the malt or inside of the grain and think you know make the grain think it's time to grow and right. then they kill it by kilning it but yeah you're right they, i mean if you know and, and depending on what their water is they may you know they may or may not even treat the water that they do that you know that germination process with so you know exactly exactly so uh getting back to the original question when is the right time to uh add the salts mm -hmm. and basically it comes back to the mash right the mash is your your main target where you want to get the ph correct but also you want to be able to make sure they have enough calcium uh, in order to uh, get best efficiency uh, with the enzymes that have to do all of the heavy lifting um, so get the calcium levels correct the magnesium you really don't have to worry about because as long as it's higher than five parts per million which it's going to be more than enough that comes from the malt itself you're going to be fine there chloride sulfate sodium none of those play a contributing factor in terms of uh, mash efficiency or enzyme performance uh, or anything like that so you don't really have to worry about that and then alkalinity is the buffer in capacity so no, 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 don't worry about that either. So it's really about getting you dial in your calcium right for the mash. Get the mash uh, calcium levels at least 50 parts per million and get the pH right. So the pH is the most important factor. Get that mash pH where it needs to be between 5.2, 5.6, uh, depending on your beer style. And uh, then you can add in the salts anywhere you want after the fact. Uh, the most important thing I think I, I worry about at that point, once I get my mash pH right and I know that my calcium levels are correct, I'll generally add in half of my salts into the mash and, and get that where I want it, at least half there. And then I'll add the other half in, in the strike water. Or in my case, I have uh, my, a big HLT and I take my strike water straight out of there. So I know that I'm going to need to add in like a lot more in order to get the water ion concentration because I'm not going to be using up the whole uh, um, the whole water uh, volume that's in the HLT. So basically, I'll just add in the other ions directly into the boil kettle at that point. Um, so that's how I do it personally. But so the most important thing I worry about at that point is getting my sparge water into dialed into the right pH. So your mash pH is important, but it's probably the second most important thing is making sure that your sparge pH uh, is down 
Now, I like to target 5.5. I know Gordon Strong, reading Gordon Strong's books, he gets it down to 5.5. Sierra Nevada uh, Brewing Company is, uh, gets their uh, brewing water down to 5.5 pH before and in their sparge water. So uh, 5.5 seems to be the magic number. And if you get it down to that, uh, the buffering um, solutions are not going to have uh, any effect. They're not, you're not adding any, any buffering with the sparge water, so it's not going to change your final um, wort pH that gets in in a, in a post boil uh, post boil volume uh, wort. So you want to make sure that if you get your mash pH at 5.3, if that's what you're really targeting, you want your your pre boil uh, wort once you reach total volume pre boil volume in in the kettle to be at at maximum 5.3. You don't want it to end up at like 5.6. And if you're using sparge water that is, you know, 6 or 7 pH, you can bet that that's going to increase the pH levels in your in your boil pH. So you want to be able to set your, your sparge water pH accordingly. Okay. Um... So we're, Brian, we're adding the salts. <laughs> the, get your mash right, right, and then exactly. Put it in after that. So uh, Brian's uh, asked another question that kind of brings everything full circle in in my mind. Um, was it's a, he says? Uh, so do you ever test your mash water and make adjustments? Now I I can tell you guys from a little bit of experience when I did a live brew day and Tony was watching. He was kind of having a, a, a conniption because I hadn't tested the water yet two or three times when I mashed in. So <laughs> I would say uh, he does have an answer on that. Um, and uh, really, and he can he can correct me if I'm wrong on here uh, on this. But, uh, you know, it, and Tony talked about having different malts with different characteristics from different uh, vendors using different water. Uh, really, the probably the thing that you want to check the most with, with your mash is going to be pH. Is that right, uh, Tony? Yeah. Yep, pH. It's all about the pH because the, the mash pH sets the course for your final beer pH. And that's really what you want to, what you want to focus on and get right. So the other salts that um, you add in after that don't really play a part in terms of the mash efficiency and what's going to happen there so his question specifically do i ever adjust the mash um absolutely because water calculators as great as they are are not 100 percent you know infallible they, they can be incorrect um for example i can you know use a specific calculator and it will you know help predict what my mash ph is going to be based on my source water profile and my uh, grains uh, that I'm going to use for that mash. Um, but it's only a prediction. So it's a ballpark uh, prediction. They try and be as best as possible. But as we've talked about, every manufacturer uses slightly different uh, water sources to create that malt. And therefore, the actual final concentrations, uh, all these predictions are based on um, Kai Troister's uh, research that he used from different malt suppliers at that time. And we're talking like a few years old. Uh, and it's not like they're, the, the, they're, the way that they produce malt changes that very much. But again, these um, there are other things to think about. Seasonal changes. What was the rain like that year? Uh, how dry was it that year? What was the humidity in the air that will affect the growth and the nitrogen levels and all sorts of other things? But anyways, mash predicted mash pHs from water calculators just a prediction so sometimes I'll I, you know I'm brewing a whip beer and it will give me a, a predicted mash pH and I'll sort of uh, look at that use that value uh, determine whether or not I want to use um, some acid malt uh, in order to reduce the pH and then finally what the mash pH ends up being is maybe a little bit lower than what the predicted mash pH would be. So in that case, I want to raise that mash pH back up to be within the range I want. And a uh, real case scenario is I was brewing up a Belgian wit, uh, used a little bit uh, too much acid malt, brought the pH down to 5.1, and I like a target of about 5.25 to 5.3. And 
So I had to add in a little bit of uh, calcium hydroxide, in, or you could use sodium bicarbonate, just a little bit in order baking to soda. raise that mash pH back up. Yeah, baking soda. Yeah. So, so there are cases where I'll, I'll I'll make adjustments afterwards as well. Okay. Nowadays, my process has changed, and it really becomes. I think most people's process will change over time. You start off working with salt additions in a certain way, and then over time, you're you're going to find that you change your process ever so slightly because you feel one way might be better than the other. For example, in the beginning, I would uh, add in my grains, I would add in the strike water, and then I would add in my salts on top of that. And I remember reading the book, uh, the water book, and uh, there was a conversation in there about, you know, by that time, you know, all of the reactions are going to occur, all the calcium that you're adding in and the magnesium, all that hardness is going to have reactions with the phosphates from the malts within the first five minutes. So by the time you get around to measuring out all the salts and adding it to the mash, you've already passed that point. So you're... You know, and then you have to stir it up inside your mash, and by that time, you know, you're you're causing reactions, but they're they're going to happen later. So you're not going to get the maximum amount of efficiency based on what you could have, or you couldn't have that pH within the range for longer period of time or the time period that you wanted in the first place. Uh, so now I add in the salts first, and then. I underlet so then uh, the water is going to mix with the salts first before it touches the the malts, and so I, uh, I that's how I do it now. So I'll add in probably about seventy five percent of the salts into the mash, and then if uh, I need to adjust more than that, then I'll uh, add the sulfate or chloride into the uh, into the boil directly. Uh, at, at what time? Right, you know, at uh, at hot break much post hot break okay uh yeah and, and i wasn't you know when i did the i did a video at aj's uh, aj's watching uh house uh, a couple weeks ago or a week ago and i wasn't going to bust him out on it but you know since he busted his himself out on it he forgot to put all of his salts and everything in until he was like halfway through the mash so that you know it does uh according to what you're saying it dilutes the effectiveness of them um you know by a by a certain degree so um i think he wound up a little bit off on his numbers, but it, the brew day came out okay. So, you know, it's a, it, it's not a complete disaster if you don't remember to put them in in the beginning. But um, Chris O asks, uh, is there a website you can visit to get accurate historical water profiles for European cities? Uh, he used an example uh, if you want to make a historical German beer. Uh, and if I can kind of what, I, what I've heard on this subject, and, and, I, and I think it was John Palmer I was watching, um, you know, there even in like brewing water, there's a lot of water profile. You know, Burton on Trent and you know, uh, um, Ho Garden and all these other places. Um, do they really? I think those breweries probably do water adjustments and filter their water and everything just like we would or our breweries here in the states. What, what, what do you? What's your input on that, Tony? That's what everyone says. That seems to know what they're talking about is that all of the breweries that existed across the world has treated their water in order to get the uh, final effects that they want for those beers uh, of those styles. When it comes to Germany, I don't know specifically of a uh, one website that, or any website that keeps track of historical uh, water concentration values or what the water concentration, ion concentrations are for those, for those cities are. Um, what is it? What about Barley, Barley, per, Barley Perkins. Uh, what's the name of that website that um, uh, keeps track of? I I don't know if he does just uh, brewing videos or just British beers. Um, shut up about Bar, uh, Barkley Perkins. That's a uh, another site. Um, BarkleyPerkins.blogspot.no. Okay. And this is probably the only guy that I know that. Um, does anything about historical beers. So, um, yeah, this one, I, I really, that's a good question that I don't know about. Um, you can think about it in terms of, or the way that I would think about it is I don't want to necessarily target a historical beer. Um, cause I think 
beer styles are are, are well defined uh, enough, and uh, those profiles for those beers are well known enough uh, and documented well enough uh, that you can use those um, uh, those profiles that exist today uh, for building up those styles. There's there's a Tri Coist or yeah Kai Troister. Um, his website, uh, I have it linked in some of my videos. Let me just go ahead and get it here really quickly. Um, Braukeister, Brau, Braukeiser.com. Um, let me see here. Braukeiser. Let me show that to you. Uh, Braukeiser. Braukeiser? B R A U Kaiser dot com K E I S E R. Yeah. Now he's a German beer. Uh, he's a German brewer, and if there's any website out there that uh, I know of that would give historical uh, values for German beers and their water concentrations, it would be on this website. Uh, and this website, if you've never been to it before, this is like one of the top three sources of information, top three websites out there for information about uh, detailed brewing uh, as you want to get. It gets as detailed as you want uh, down here. Uh, there are breweries, German, and some history information. Um, there's all sorts of th information on here on, uh, on water. Uh, I did cover it in the last video when I was talking about different uh, all the five different calculators that I covered in the last, uh, on the three, the third part of this water series and kite Troyster, He's got his own calculator here that I did demonstrate in the video, but he's also the guy behind the water calculator up on brewersfriend.com. Um, if you're not able to find a specific, uh, water profile or a historical water profile for a specific style or a, a German beer city, he would probably be the guy to send an email to, and I bet you he would be able to get you that information. Uh, he's well connected to everybody in the brewing community. Everybody knows who he is, uh, all the pros. And so I'm sure he seems like a friendly guy. Uh, and, you know, as uh, most home brewers are, you know, uh, and he's a home brewer, and he's also, uh, uh, I think, uh, Kind of like John Palmer, he's involved a lot in different brewer, pro brewer stuff, but maybe doesn't have his own. He doesn't have his own professional brewery, but uh, a lot of professional brewers seek his advice for specific things. So he would be the guy to ask that that specific uh, question to. Dank Fu <laughs> on the uh, chat asked a question about. Um, there's a product I can't remember the manufacturer, but it uh, it's sold as like five point two pH stabilize, stabilizer. Um, I, I used it in the beginning of my, you know, when I started brewing, but can you speak to whether that's very effective or not? Or, you know, is it something that people should rely on to, to help with their mash pH? Uh, I, in my personal opinion, it's a complete waste of money. And in um, AJ DeLang, as well as uh, Martin Brugord, the guy that writes Brewing Water Water Calculator in his Water Calculator Water, water Knowledge uh, page, he'll tell you straight up. It's uh, something that was created for one specific brewery who had a very special water profile uh, in order to uh, reduce uh, their alkalinity. And the way that they do that is using mostly uh, sodium and phosphoric uh, ions, uh, phosphorus. So. If you want more sodium, if you've got low concentrations of sodium in your water and uh, you're, you're not afraid about going above a certain threshold for specific styles, then go ahead and use it. And sodium is the lowest contributing ion that will affect pH uh, in any way. It's a fraction of what calcium and magnesium is. Um, you know, thinking about magnesium is only it's less than half, half as effective as calcium and sodium is just a fraction of the magnesium so it does almost little in order to bring down the ph um and 
if you have the ability to test your pH, you will guaranteed based on hundreds, actually probably thousands of other home brewers that are out there up on the various forums that are out there will tell you using 5.2 does not lock your water profile down into 5.2. 5.6 to 5.8 is more realistic. Um, 5.8 seems to be the average. So if, as long as that's okay with you, then by all means, uh, go for it. But I would say no way. Absolutely no way. <laughs> uh, and the same amount of investment that you make to buy one can of 5.2 sta pH stabilizer, you're going to be able to buy a bag of calcium sulfate, a bag of calcium chloride, which is going to give you all that calcium that you need to bring that pH down more than the 5.2 stabilizer will ever do. And there it is. That's my personal opinion of it. Complete <laughs> waste of money. Yeah, I've always, mm -hmm. I, I always kind of thought that myself uh, as well. You know, I, I didn't, uh, it just seemed, you know, too good to be true that, you know, it was the magic bullet that you could just, you know, add two tablespoons of this to your mash and it was perfect. You know, <laughs> so I just, I never did believe that either. Right. So. Um, I'm very surprised that such a company would have that product around for so long. I'm, I can understand it. There is a, f a fraction of a benefit to it uh, under certain circumstances, but for the majority, it seems like a complete waste. Whereas the rest of the Five Star brand is phenomenal. Uh, love the other products that they they produce. I, I buy the other two, um, you know, the PBW, and then also the. Uh, Star Sand, great products. 5.2 pH stabilizer, not so much. <laughs> um, Jeff Madre asks, um, any suggestions for brewing with softened water other than don't? I mean, is there a, is there a situation where uh, softened water would be okay? I mean, most of the time, if I, if I, I don't have a water softener, but if I understand correctly, it's just they add salt to the water to soften it. Um, I know that some breweries use it to clean their stainless steel with because it doesn't leave as much of a, a film or, you know, it's not a hard water. So uh, any suggestions on that at all? Most water softeners that are in the industry are using sodium in order to convert uh, the alkalinity um, to, to bring that alkalinity down. So those are the conditions. Um, the water book actually has a good section on uh, water softeners and the waters that they're going to provide. Again, there, there are two different avenues that they use. And I think the most common is they're adding lots of sodium uh, ions into your, your water. So it's a similar circumstances of uh, using that 5.2 pH stabilizer. Um, I don't think that uh, water softeners are using uh, so much uh, phosphorus or phosphates, but um, yeah. Um, okay. If you use a, coming back to that 5.2 thing, I, I, there's <laughs> one more thing that I heard. <clears throat> and I, I remember reading off this, there was a, a chemist up on uh, one of the popular home brewing forums and he was actually working out uh, the, the content of 5.2 and he says basically it's the same thing as as a zero fifteen zero fertilizer um anybody that's familiar with uh fertilizers and doing lots of yard work you may be familiar if you uh lack fertilizer and you need it you could use 5.2 for that <laughs> instead so if you have any 5.2 left over you're good to go uh, fertilize your your wife's roses with it <laughs> Uh, um, Brian Harkin. Miles may vary. Uh, yeah, right. Mileage may vary. Exactly. Brian Harkin uh, the, says uh, his water has a funny taste, uh, so he use he tends to use uh, five gallon bottled water. And should he expect consistency with that? So, like, if he buys it from the same manufacturer uh, pretty much every time, should he expect some level of consistency with that? Uh, and I, you know, I guess it's probably hard to say for sure. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'd, ha I'd be guessing, but I would yeah. think as being a, as a water manufacturer, I would put my water through a specific process and that I would want to produce the same product time and time again. Same thing as a beer producer, right? I mean, you go out and you buy the grapefruit sculpin. When you open up a new bottle of grapefruit sculpin, you want it to taste like that beer. Um, I think water manufacturers are in the same boat. They'll put the water sources that they get through the same filtration processes and 
whatever things they do with that water, they're going to want a consistent product. So that's an assumption. I'm I'm guessing from right. the you know that's a sort of a standard bar. I think I would say, but again, I would I would expect it to be the same. Sure. Uh, Dank Fu uh, wants to know uh, when is your book coming out and can you get an autographed copy and <laughs> will you be at the GABF this year? <laughs> I had lived on the signed copy part. <laughs> this is the book that you want. This is the book. And coming back to the other point, uh, creatures of habit, the more you, that you do something or involve yourself with, uh, the better you're going to get at it. So I know when I first, the first time I read that book, it was uh, complete Greek to me, um, and but you just stick to it. You go out and you consume all of the other resources that are out there because 15 different people will explain it to you 15 different ways, and hopefully the different ways that uh, you're consuming these uh, pieces of information will eventually all come together and start to make sense and be able to put it all together uh, in a way that makes it very useful for you. So just... Um, you know, drill through it and then do it again and again and again. Um, so yeah, practice there's, makes there's enough right? books out there. <laughs> about it. Yeah, because Greg Noonan's books was another great one. I think that was what surprised me the most was uh, you know how to brew lager beers um, or brew and lager beers new book. I forget the name of it. It's linked in my first video, but uh, that beer had that book had a great water section uh, specifically. If you're interested in learning all about um, the the atoms and the ions and bringing it all together, you know, the material that I put together in my first video about water was uh, a lot of it came straight out of his book. So, um, you know, kudos to Greg Dunin. He's no longer with us anymore, but uh, yeah, great guy. He was a you know he was a brewing up the the Vermont Brew Pub actually where the alchemist uh, of it, or influenced uh, uh what's his name who heads up the, uh, the famous heady topper now but anyways um i'm thinking about going to uh the home brewers conference this year june in oregon portland oregon so yeah i'm seriously considering it i've got the uh the permission uh to go <laughs> that's the first part <laughs> from uh, the family yeah and it's about the right time of year, so uh, I, sh I should be able to sneak away for that week, actually. I'll probably spend a couple of days up in Seattle and then uh, work my way down to Portland and uh, hopefully get up to, to meet a, a lot of uh, great other brew tubers that uh, will also be there. So you just uh, you mentioned um, Vermont and Hetty Topper and some of those, and that kind of – that flipped a switch in my mind. Um, I saw a question. I didn't capture it, but I saw a question – and uh you know the, the the new kid style on the block or the the new, the new style on the block that everybody is you know all the rave the new ipa is is the uh the new england ipa the ne ipa um uh, from my understanding you know it kind of flips some of the concentrations of sulfate and chloride on its head and can you do you know uh can you give us some advice on what type of a water profile to used to brew those and and you know what are the differences between like a standard american ipa and that new a new england ipa if you have you know dove into what, what those water compositions are i don't think that i would be able to say anything more than what other people have said out there uh about that beer style specifically um there's a lot of people out there that say uh, that you know you want to basically flip the chloride to sulfate ratio on your head or on its head uh, versus what you would be brewing for a west coast IPA where you might want 4.5 4.5 uh, 4.5 of sulfate to your one of chloride uh, and then instead flip that around and say then you're going to have 4.5 of chloride to your one part of, of sulfate in order to get that sort of uh, uh, more uh yeah that, that fruity slick mouthfeel uh aspects um i did run across a photo there was a discussion and a, a photo that somebody took of actually one of the water profiles or the brew sheet at the alchemist uh for the heady topper up on uh hbt uh website homebrew talk 
and uh, the 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 belief that the the chloride to sulfate ratio is offset in favor of chloride is not uh, true. It doesn't stand that that actual argument or that assumption uh, based on what the guys were uh, from this picture. In fact, it had more uh, resemblance to a Burton on Trent uh, profile than it did uh, anything else, uh, the opposite. However, that's not trillium. That's not uh, tired hands or I'm not sure of the other ones in that area, but uh, there are other popular Northeast New England uh, breweries that are brewing or famous for New England IPAs and those juice bombs. Um, Hetty Topper was never, never uh, referred to as a juice bomb. It was like the godfather or the beginning of the New England IPA movement, but it was never about being all that juicy. It was about being balanced and uh, in such a way like Pliny the Elders, like just the perfectly balanced IPA. It's not like that it's like super hoppy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that, yeah, it's just that it's a super balanced and just like a, a world-class beer, very similar to like a Vesslever and 12, for example. Mm -hmm. It's not like that's like, uh, it's a, it's a well-balanced beer and that's what makes it world-class. Um, so this whole, uh, juicy, hazy, uh, um, trend is, uh, is not necessarily associated or I wouldn't necessarily put them in the same camp as a heady topper. Heady topper is you know, a little bit cloudy. It's not clear, but it's not hazy either. Uh, and it certainly doesn't have any of the particulates that you might find in some of these other juice bombs. I've always so, followed directions and drank yeah, it in the can, just... so I don't know what it looks like. So Brian, Brian, go ahead. No, no, it's just there are other beers. The Focal Banger is probably closer to a, a juicy hot bomb than... Uh, Hetty Toppers. Hetty Toppers just like extremely well balanced. Yeah, it's a great IPA, beer. Great beer. Or a double IPA. But um, the, the the other ones that they have, uh, the Crusher is phenomenal. Um, but the Focal Banger is the one that pushes the the juicy hoppiness over the top. Uh, and that one definitely has some particulates in the bottom if you pour it out of the can. I got you. Uh, Brian Harkin asks, uh, "What is what's your favorite brew?" I guess uh, I'm going to assume he's like your favorite one to consume. Um, you probably have a favorite style to to brew as well, which may or may not be the same as your favorite one. But uh, what's what's your favorite? I like a great IPA. I like a good pale ale, a good IPA. I like the hoppiness. I like the fruitiness, the citrus, the the pine, the the resin. I like. Uh, I like that sort of uh, initial hit on the palate. Um, I really dig those those styles of beers. Um, Stone IPAs makes a really great uh, IPA. Stone IPA, of course. Um, there are several several out there. Um, I love good double IPAs when they're made really well, like Hitty Topper. But I don't like them in the fact that you can only have like one or two, yeah. and then your night's done. So <laughs> yeah. a nice uh, sessionable IPA. Sessionable IPAs are really nice. Um, uh, one that you can have two or three of, like a, a Stone IPA or a Sculpin, a Grapefruit Sculpin, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, my, uh, but then again, I like to change it up because after you have so many different IPAs, if you have two or three, if you have a fourth one, then you may get that palate fatigue, and it's time to change it up and, you know, maybe have uh, a brown ale or a porter or something like that, just to sort of switch it up and reset the palate a little bit. Yeah, I find that a little yeah. bit, you know, myself, I'll, I'll have IPAs and I'll kind of get tired of them for a little while because it's like, you know, I think after a while your palate gets so used to those flavors and the bitterness and that it, that it kind of, it basically, it, everything starts to taste the same. And then, you know, you have to take that break and reset it and then, you know, go back and it, learn, learn to love for them again. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of chemistry behind there as well uh, when it comes to the hops and the, the, the bitterness and the, the acids that are involved with those. Um, and the reactions that occur um, in order to uh, you know, get these flavors, whether or not it's going to be citrusy or fruity or earthy, herbal, hop, uh, just generally hoppy. 
Um, and when you start clashing these, if you change the style that you're drinking, uh, you're going to get this clash. Sometimes it's beneficial and it becomes an, an enhanced IPA and you say, oh, well, this one's better than the last one. But there are those other occasions where it actually clashes with the, the previous IPA that you were drinking. And then it seems like, oh, okay, this one's not as great as the other one, even though I had this one yesterday and it was phenomenal. So maybe this other one that I thought was phenomenal is not so good as the first one I had. And it's not that it's any less uh, of an IPA that you experienced the night before. It's just that uh, some of these those acids can clash on the palate and you know be perceived as less pleasurable. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it's nice to have a palate reset at that point. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. You can get burnt out from time to time for sure. Uh, Floor Sweepers Union mm -hmm. comes out of left field here in the. Uh, wants to know if you think that the Hoppy New Zealand Pilsner is the next NEIPA. I personally have not had a Hoppy New uh, New Zealand Pilsner myself, but uh, I, I you may have had some experience with it. I don't know. <clears throat> I have not had the pleasure of experiencing <laughs> a New Zealand uh, one of those beers. No, the. Uh, what was it? A hoppy lager? A, a, hoppy, a hoppy New Zealand Pilsner. So I don't know. I, you know. <laughs> hoppy New Zealand <laughs> That sounds like a, a, no, a, a I, IPL, sure. India Pale Lager, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've only mm. had, I think, uh, one IPL mm. here, and it was brewed in Sweden. Um, mm. But no, I, I haven't had many of those. Um, I haven't brewed any of those myself. So, no, I haven't. And whether or not it's the next New England uh, IPA or trendy beer towards the New England IPA, uh, possibly in New Zealand it will be, and maybe uh, in neighboring countries. I, right. I It'll be a NZ um, IPA. <laughs> yeah, if he's still listening, uh, me and the family, I do plan on taking the family down there uh, at some point in the next uh, 10 years. It'll be either in October or February. So uh, maybe we'll get to meet up at some point. So I have a question myself. Um, I'm actually thinking about embarking on uh, trying to do some loggers. And so what I, I know just from like off the top of my head that those water profiles for loggers are much uh, softer profile. Uh, what can you tell me on, on those right. as far as like, you know, what what uh, what's a good water profile for a logger? what lager style because there's literally a hundred of them if it's going to be a pilsner it's going to be different than a hellas which is going to be different than a uh, <clears throat> a, a bach uh versus a my bach versus uh a, a doppel bach so the different loggers are going to have different uh target brewing islands as well um when Coming back, you know, I trust what uh, the consensus is that uh, John and, and uh, Colin put out in the water book. So I'll take those as a guideline and then use that as a baseline. And uh, when you're brewing, I mean, you're not going to brew just one lager in your life. So, mm -hmm. you know, take notes, take good notes and then make any changes accordingly. And then, of course, you know, read what other people's experiences are out there. I think one of the latest Brewlosophy articles was fantastic about uh, testing the different levels of sodium, and it was specifically geared towards a lager beer. Okay. Um, really quick and fast and dirty on that was that a lot of people believe that the sodium ion contents for a good lager beer is going to be really low, uh, low levels of sulfate, low levels of uh, chloride, calcium again. Uh, should be at least uh, around 50 regardless. Um, so if you can get uh, those low level ions around uh, soft water, because I think people use that because they associate uh, great lagers with beers that come from areas that have very soft water, like Pilsen. Pilsen, uh, Germany is a, a place, or Pilsen, uh, Czech, has a very soft water with very low mineral contents, similar actually to here in Norway. And so they'll use that. They think that the brewers who brew those beers use that water as is in order to get that nice, clean, crisp lager flavor. 
uh, the brewlosophy, uh, one of the tests was that they did one with very low ion content. Um, with the calcium or the uh, sulfate to chloride ratio, they tried to map it out almost evenly, one to one, to get that, that a balance there. But the sodium, one beer was brewed with sodium, very, very low, as low as they could get based on the source water. And then the other one was sodium levels that was up to 100 parts per million. And basically all of the water profiles from the water brew book and most uh, recommended uh, beer styles or water profiles for all beer styles is to keep the sodium levels less than 100. Well, they pushed it right up to 100 and see what the difference was. Long story short, um, they had a, um, not overwhelming, but a consensus that a majority of the people could tell the differences between the two beers and that a majority of the people preferred the ones with the high sodium content. Hmm. And most of the, the feedback came back and said that they were cleaner and crisper than the ones with the low sodium content. But that again, that was towards a very specific, that specific, uh, it was a light lager, uh, a generic light lager uh, beer style. Yeah, so, that's really interesting. It's all based on experience. Do those sort of uh, wide spectrum analysis. You know, do mm -hmm. one with low, do one with the recommended max, see which ones you prefer, and make adjustments for the third beer according to what your preference was. Right. Well, I have asked a couple of times for some more questions, and, um, you know, I'm really, really thankful that uh, Tony has spent some time with us today. And, uh, you know, if you guys want to ask some more questions, uh, please, you know, by all means do so uh, in a quick fashion if you can. Um, you know, Tony's time is valuable to him, and I want to respect that. But, you know, I, I'm truly, truly grateful, Tony, for, uh, you know, you spending the time with, with my viewers, and I'm sure some of your viewers are on here as well. But I really, really appreciate your time, you know, and, and um, if, if no one else has any other questions, We'll probably go ahead and wrap it up. I'll get some of Tony's, you know, final thoughts on water if he has some other, any other, you know, quick recommendations or whatever, and uh, we'll we'll wrap it up from there. So um, I will go ahead and turn it back over to you if you want to give some final words, Tony. And again, thank you so much. <laughs> no, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the time. Uh, thanks a lot for asking me to do this. Uh, it's great that we, we finally got to do it after <laughs> trying to get this happen uh, a few times. Uh, the internet wasn't uh, very cooperative uh, uh, the, the first couple of times, but hey, here it is. It's, it's phenomenal. Uh, I love talking about water. I like talking about brewing. So anytime that we get to be able to hook up and you know focus on that uh, uh, topic, brewing and water and anything else uh, brewing related it's just it's phenomenal it's really fantastic so hey thanks a lot for uh taking the initiative and making this happen Absolutely. in terms of uh what water go ahead go ahead <laughs> ah, in terms of water what, what water means to me is uh it's like you said during that uh that point where when i was watching your brew day and you hadn't tested anything in your water up to you know you were already halfway through the mash I was like, unbelievable, because uh, it was like, you know, for me, I'm testing water before I'm uh, actually um, in the HLT. You know, I test the water in the HLT. Um, at least once a quarter, I'll do a water test with the, the Brew Lab test kit. Uh, so I always keep my water profile up to date because it does change ever so slightly from season to season. Um, if you're on a, on a different water source, it's going to change even more frequently. So uh, that's something to think about. Just one thing real quickly, and I know you I guess you're, are you getting interrupted there, Tony? <laughs> yeah, just for a second. Okay, all right. It's okay. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the that's question okay. while, you're, while, you're, uh, while you're dealing with that. Um, and this actually didn't come up yet, but uh, I can give you, uh, Chris Kearns asked, um, what are some of the, like if you're starting with RO water, what are some of the basic uh, chemicals uh, that you would use to adjust certain things? Can you kind of real quickly hit on, you know, to adjust sulfates, you can do this, uh, chloride, this, you know, um, you know, pH, obviously there's, you know, some things there. I have two or three things myself in my uh, uh, supplies. Yeah. That there's I about use. four salts that I would keep in my uh, closet at that time uh, to be able to use closet, tool bag, toolbox, whatever. Um, 
anything that brings calcium to the table because you're going to want to add hardness to the the water so calcium sulfate calcium chloride uh the other thing is that you're if you're going to be brewing dark beers then more than likely that ph is going to need to be raised so then you want your sodium bicarbonate or baking soda uh, in order to raise that ph and add buffering capacity to the water to make sure that your ph you know for brewing a dark beer is going to be higher than 5.2 and you know uh, maybe upwards of 5.4 5.5 uh, for a dark beer um and uh sodium uh like uh sodium chloride uh, table salt or uh, yeah rock salt and if you want to be adding in more sodium uh, to your water as well if you want to get those clean crisp lager beers so basically those four uh salts i would uh, have in your toolbox uh, and then your your acids you would say water. like phosphoric or lactic acid would be uh another thing to have well that's for decreasing uh uh, pH, but when you're starting off with reverse osmosis, which actually oh, has true, no yeah. buffering capacity yeah. whatsoever, you're probably never going to have to worry about adding acid uh, to yeah. bring the pH uh, down. I forgot the question for a minute. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, Tony, again, and, uh, in fact, um, on that point, no, I think it's a good point because. Uh, um, I don't know. This guy is sort of polarizing. You either hate him or you like him or love him. Uh, George, Gordon Strong, his latest book, uh, uh, Modern Homebrew Recipes, he, he re uses reverse osmosis. And for every single one of the, the beers, that, the recipes that he's included in this book, which the book is mostly recipes of all different styles, he basically tells you what uh, salts he adds in his reverse osmosis water for each one of these uh, beers in there. So if you uh, like all those different beers that he's included in that book, I mean, you, know, you could follow his guidance and, you know, Gordon Strong is Gordon Strong. Uh, whether you like <laughs> it or not, he is the grandmaster uh, BJCP guide in, in the U.S. So. The Grand Poobah. Or in the world. <laughs> yep, he's a Grand Poobah. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone that was uh, on the live stream here watching and uh, all the questions and all the participation. I know I saw a lot of chat going on between everyone. I always really enjoy to see the community, you know, interacting with each other and just having a good time. And, you know, that that's ultimately, you know, as much science as you want to throw into it or whatever, you know, brewing beers about having fun. Don't let this, you, you know, I wanted to do this water discussion because a lot of people ask questions about it, but don't stress out too much over it you know make sure you're still having fun make sure you're still having a good time and that you're you're enjoying the process because really that's i mean that's what it's about so you know make sure that that you're you're enjoying yourself and and learning as you go you know i mean you know don't try to don't try to eat elephant in one bite you know maybe start you know start with some spring water or whatever and try to figure out you know what the issues are with that and and uh you know a lot of people like to dive in but you know just make sure you're having a good time and and, and enjoying it so um I really appreciate Tony's time again, and uh, we are going to wrap it up now, and we will see you guys on the next video. Thanks a lot, Brian. Thank Thanks, everybody.